Thank you everyone for being here, calling this meeting to order this evening. Um, first order of business is me dropping my water. Um, it, it is um, going to be the request and petitions of citizens. First off, I want to remind everybody about the rules of decorum. Um, and please pay attention because we do not want to have to ask people to leave or sit, um, be removed from the chambers for violating these, okay? This does not limit anything you can say, but there are certain rules we ask that you follow. First, only the person that has signed up to speak will be allowed to speak. There are no substitutions. Only one person is allowed to stand at the podium at one time. The podium is now located there instead of the front of the room, just so you know. Time limit will be enforced by me with Gail's help. Speakers are limited to one appearance per meeting. Sharing or relinquishing um, remaining time to another speaker is not allowed. Speaking time cannot be assigned to another speaker. All comments should be addressed to the council as a whole and not to individual council members or staff members. This, again, this does not limit what speakers can talk about but you cannot call out either council members or staff by name. And failure to obey these rules of decorum will forfeit remaining speaking time. And as I said, you'll be warned the first time and then you'll be asked to, to leave the chambers. So if everybody follows those rules, um, we shouldn't have any problems. And thank you for that, okay? So our first person coming up, <laughs> I love it. Bruce Blankenhorn. Um, Bruce, come on up, representing. Thank you, Mayor and City Council members. I'm Bruce Blankenhorn. I live on Braddock Drive, and I'm a USAPA pickleball ambassador here in Raleigh. Pickleball is played on a court less than half the size of a tennis court. It's typically played as a doubles game with a lot of movement and quickness. Nationally, the growth of pickleball is phenomenal, double digits annually. In Raleigh, we're growing three times as fast as the national average. Prior to 2011, pickleball in Raleigh was almost unknown. In 2012, one gym, Briar Creek, let us out, uh, went out on a limb and let us play one night a week. We had about 12 players. We jumped to 30. By 2014, we had 300, and we didn't know where to put them all. City Parks and Rec squeezed us in at several other gyms. We kept doubling 2016, 17, 18. We now have about 4,000 active pickleball players in Raleigh. The startling influx is young players. The gray segments on this graph represent players over 45. The red segments signify players younger than 45. They are pouring in. Pickleball classes are being taught in our middle schools, our high schools, and our colleges. Uh, Parks and Rec tallies over 1,200 regular pass holders, giving us access to play in the 11 city gyms. That number does not begin to capture players at tennis centers, country clubs, uh, church gyms, courts erected on driveways, and in cul-de-sacs. It's an active, healthy, and social game. Many of us have lost weight, strengthened our hearts. We are also extremely diverse. Uh, Rudy Patterson and his team, all of them Fred Fletcher Award winners, teach this game to people living with Parkinson's. Lisa Strong teaches classes for cancer survivors. The other two ambassadors, Joe Borelli and Jim Wang, and Rudy and I, regularly teach everybody who wants to learn. We have in place a Raleigh Pickleball Advisory Group, President Suzette Brown, who works in coordination with Billy Aubert of Parks and Rec, which has been extremely helpful and open to our growth. His team is squeezing us into as many gyms as possible, shuffling hours while sharing courts with basketball, badminton, and after-school programs. We are cramped. We shoehorn in our one tournament, the Raleigh Spring Smash, but other cities have vastly better pickleball facilities. The Powerade games and our state senior games have to be played in other cities. Tournaments bring hundreds of visiting competitors, each bringing customers and revenue to our businesses, but we haven't the facility to host significant events. Raleigh needs a public pickleball facility 
with a minimum of 12 indoor and 12 outdoor contiguous courts staffed and dedicated full-time to pickleball. Wow. <laughs> So Mayor, your three minutes are up. May I ask my pickleball players to stand? I will ask them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So can all the pickleball players who are here came, came out tonight? So I just heard about this phenomenon. And um, I also heard about chicken, chicken and pickle. Have you heard of chicken and pickle? Okay. Yeah, so I, I think we need a pork and pickle, but we'll <laughs> we'll see about that. But um, anyhow, um, you're probably referencing the um, the um, Briar Creek area um, tennis and pickleball center that is coming forward with some requests. So we will take that under advisement, and we thank you all for coming out to our meeting tonight and taking um, time out of your day. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And watch the hamstring muscles. Watch the hamstring muscles. I know three people who play pickleball who have pulled theirs. So. We're going to wait until clear up. Oh, boy. I would ask all of those who are scheduled to speak um, during the um, petition of citizens to please come forward to the front rows. Okay, Mr. Chad Essick, how'd you like to follow that now? That's tough, that is really tough. <laughs> okay, thank you for being here. Thank you, um, uh, good evening Mayor Baldwin, members of City Council, uh, Chad Essig with Porter Sproul 301 Fable Street, Suite 1900. I'm here this evening on behalf of Highwoods Properties seeking authorization from the council to submit a text change application to modify some existing zoning conditions governing a vacant parcel of land that Highwoods owns in the Glen Lake Office Park. That parcel is highlighted here at the corner of Edwards Mill and Park Lake Avenue. Um, Glen Wake uh, Office Park is currently comprised of over 750,000 square feet of office, um, for, and, but does not have any real retail or um, eating establishment uses within walking distance of its office users. Uh, to address that, in 2017, Highwoods went through the rezoning process and rezoned this parcel uh, from OX to CX. Um, uh, in order to facilitate some of those retail and eating establishment uses. There were uh, some zoning conditions placed on that rezoning which were geared towards trying to mimic uh, some of the limitations on reading it, retail and eating establishments in the OX district 
including no drive-throughs, uh, no uh, uh, limits on hours of operation, limits to 20,000 square feet, and also limits it to no more than 9,000 in any one establishment. All those conditions are fine. Those are not a problem. There was one condition that was placed on it that required the retail and eating establishments to be in the ground floor of a multi-story building. Uh, that has proven to be a little bit infeasible and impractical for a couple reasons. We've had some office users come to us that would like to take the whole office building, all 200,000 square feet as part of uh, a relocation, as well as uh, we've had retail and eating establishment users are concerned about the viability of being tucked away in the ground floor of an office building and not being visible and their ability to be able to, to succeed. So uh, with those two, uh, those two issues and the, and the hopes to hopefully get some uh, some thriving retail and eating establishments uh, on this property and in this office park so people don't have to get in their cars and go to uh, Crabtree to eat lunch uh, to enhance the walkability. Um, we would like to uh, submit an application to amend the zoning conditions to remove that. We would also have some minor conditions we'd like to amend regarding parking. Again, tonight is just a, a request under the UDO to authorize us to file the application. Once we file the application, then we'll have our we'll have our neighborhood meeting, then file the application, go through the CAC Planning Commission, and back for public hearing. So, uh, again, tonight we're just asking to authorize to be able to file that text change, and uh, would respectfully request that the City Council authorize us to do so. Mr. Knight, this is your district. Um, uh, yeah, this is Highwoods is my district. Yeah, I would like to move uh, to approve his request. Okay. Second. This is a little out of the road, but, you know. Oh, is it? Okay. Whose district is it in? This is in District E. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, okay. I thought Well, you moved to, uh, you made I'll the motion. <laughs> you can second it. I'm sorry. And, I'm yes. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thanks for being proactive, Councillor Cox. <laughs> okay, next is Kimberly um, Mutarian. Hey, Kimberly. Kimberly Mctarian, um, can you pause it? I'm supposed to give you my name and my address, correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. No problem. Stop the clock, please. It's not paused. It's not paused. Go back to three, please. Who's over the clock? You are. There you go. Okay. There we go. Dr. Kimberly Mctarian, 4224 Crowfield Drive. Raleigh, North Carolina, 27610. I am here um, to address a very serious situation in Southeast Raleigh, and spe uh, specifically Martin Luther King's statue. Um, and I would like to address it from what bothered me on an incident prior to um, talking about this issue. Uh, October 26, we had a forum at Vital Link where well, we were told that a chief had concerns about um, her officers being amongst us because she didn't want them to be ambushed. Let me say this, when we come to the table, we don't bring our guns, and many of us don't, don't have any to bring. But each and every time we go to the McKimmon Center, we are outnumbered in the hundreds with officers who always will have guns. And I don't think that's a fair statement because immediately after that statement, she, um, the chief of police along with the police department did a PSA at Martin Luther King and invited the public. So I'm a little confused. Are you scared of us? Or do you want us to host with you at our statue? Now, um, there are very conflicting messages between the community and this department. And I will say this. Um, a young man was stopped. His car was moved uh, from one location to the Martin Luther King Park for them to further search his car. Um, I think that's highly disrespectful because if you want your statues honored, please do not degrade ours. We do not conduct searches on your capital or the Nash Park or Josephus Daniels, we do not um, disrespect any statue, but for you to take a car and further search it, that is a park, 
a thousand feet from a statue in a, um, sorry, a park and a school should not be violated according to North Carolina state statute. So again, we're asking for just minimum respect. We're looking for a city who will leave us some amount of dignity. And a lot has already been taken, but if you can just not touch our dignity, I think that would, would be all that we could ask for at this time. And I think that's how you repair relationships is that you be honest and transparent. Because if you wanna represent Martin Luther King, what you don't do is you don't bring your handcuffs because he linked like this and he didn't use any weapon. We lay down our weapons, you lay down yours. Thank you. Next, we have Douglas Johnson. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Doug Johnston, 120 Forest Road, and I'm a big fan, as you can probably tell from the pictures, of Dick's Park. And I'm real excited about the master plan and the EDGE study as well. I was, uh, before I retired, counsel to the state treasurer and local government commission, so I tend to naturally see Dick's Park as an investment. And as an investment, there's a strategy that is often required. The strategy for Dick's Park involves the edges and the way we use them. The edge to a space is often as important as the space it encloses. And when we make the edges align with the park, we preserve the park and we boost the value of the edge to the people around it. Some developers will confront the park aggressively and in some places that will be appropriate. Uh, it's good to have a lot of people around the park. In other places we'll find that it's necessary to do it loosely and gently and defer to the park values it may seem at that time to some of the people that might be developing property around the park a, uh, a sacrifice, but uh, I'm intent to uh, demonstrate that's not the case. I won't try to do that tonight, but eventually I will. The other side of the uh, investment in the park, and I was advised to say now, and we'll switch from Dick's Park to Sheep Meadow in Manhattan. Now, my friends in the park, Dick's Park progress e effort often say, Doug, why are you worried about the edges? New York has lots of buildings around the edges. And I say, that's exactly right, and I'm really excited about it, but please remember Fifth Avenue and the other street on the far side, Central Park West, is 100 feet wide, and both those streets have sidewalks of 25 or 30 feet. So already you're 150 feet away from the park. And my view is when you look at that park there, you, you see the park and the buildings are there and I'm here and they're sort of, with the possible exception of those pencil thin buildings, it looks like an escarpment and it works really, really well. And people love that park and I know they will love Dick's Park. The alliance between people that will align and have a symbiotic relationship with the park uh, is well understood in many other places, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug, for coming out tonight. Next is Johnny Thomas. Hello, my name is Johnny Thomas. I'm from 911 South Blunt Street. I wish to first thank the City Council for allowing me to come here again. Um, this is my attempt at direct action. I seek to create a conversation about some issues facing Raleigh citizens and to establish creative ways to resolve them. For years, we have heard the word wait. We are looking into it. It rings in the ear of every member of our community with piercing familiarity. 
The word wait, and we are looking into it, almost always meant never. It has been tranquilizing for the purpose of relieving the emotional stresses for a moment in leadership, only to give rise and birth to frustrations within our community. I'm going to refer to a quote by the late Dr. Martin Luther King. We must come to see that human progress never rose in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of persistent work of men willing to be co-workers with God, and without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally to the forces of social stagnation. The reason I find this so pertinent here today is because in recent events, I, my resolve has been strengthened. I come before Raleigh, as I have in the past, requesting the establishment of a public advocate for every citizen here. I'm going to state a quick fact. 13% of Roddy voters voted in the last election. 13% of 469,298 people. That means 61,000 people decided the fate of Raleigh for at least the next two years. That's not good. We, when I spoke to citizens about the election and their thoughts, many, many told me the same thing. The main thing is they didn't bother to vote because they feel disconnected with leadership. I want people to learn and understand how community engagement can work. I want to share messages of hope. I want to inspire people to start to have conversations again, to talk to each other, to connect with each other, to move each other in a better direction, in a different direction. We need to stop the theory that being part of a party is what is needed. We wish to, f yeah, I'm gonna skip to this because I have 31 seconds. The main reason I'm here is because I want a public advocate for all of us. And then one of the things that just touched on me is what a lady said is what's going on with the police. As a part of a public advocate, a public advocate can initiate a community action engagement plan. We can have a sensitivity and de-escalation training for police. In conjunction, we need a community compliance. The community needs to comply with the police as well as the police needs to work with the community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Next, we have Barbara Smalley McMahon. I am Barbara Smalley McMahon, and I live at 602 North Bloodworth Street. In November, I attended community discussions on policing and had conversations with police officers who shared their beliefs that increasing transparency and accountability in policing could increase trust and safety for people and police officers in Raleigh. Likewise, I shared my belief that a police officer with expert knowledge of RPD policies and procedures could be valuable, a valuable asset on a review board for citizens' complaints. I also shared Raleigh PAC's support of a discipline matrix approved by members of Raleigh Police Protective Association, RPD, and community board members selected by the mayor, city council members, and grassroots organizations. I came away grateful that folks who might otherwise have continued to think we're at odds with one another came to realize we share the common ground of wanting safety for everyone. Not too long after that, a white woman was stopped on St. Mary's Street on suspicion of driving under the influence. When I saw the video footage and watched the officer unzip her jacket, jiggle her breast, rub her, his hands across her buttocks, and tell her to spread her legs wider so he could run his hands over her crotch for a possible weapon, my anger was triggered by the humiliation and lack of safety I could imagine this woman felt. After her attorney a publicly announced a belief that the officer had sexually assaulted her client, Chief Deck Brown, went on record in defense of the proper protocol the officer followed Barbara, during a please, down. This is a warning, okay? I asked at the beginning to follow proper decorum. That means you do not mention a staff person by name. 
Oh, do you understand? I do. Okay. okay I'm sorry. For if that, that happens again, I'm yeah. going to have to ask you to leave. Yeah, okay? that was an oversight. I appreciate okay. appreciate you for thank you telling me. Okay. Yeah. What I know as a woman with a history of sexual assault at an early age and as a mental health professional who worked with adult victims of incest in childhood is that anyone, male or female, who's been overpowered and sexually violated could be re-traumatized by RPD's accepted practices and procedures. While I share concerns for the safety of our officers, I also believe RPD's system of policing needs reforms to ensure the safety and respect of vulnerable people. In closing, I want to welcome you as Raleigh's new mayor and members of city council and to urge you to be open to learning from the people who've, who are harmed by stops and searches strategies like those charles your, your time's up i know thank you and there are two books that i reference that i hope you all will read your and I'll time share is up this. thank you um do we have any information to address this mr city manager certainly uh the citizen is referencing the community conversations that occurred in the month of november staff is compiling the feedback from those sessions into a report that we will be presenting to you in the first month or so of uh, the upcoming year so january february time frame after we make sure we put all that together there was a lot of information provided so we're compiling that right now we'll bring it back to you okay thank you joshua bradley Good Congratulations, evening. everybody. Josh Bradley, 1324 Spring Lawn Court, Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, I had prepared notes, but in order to make the meeting, I ran out without them, so you're going to have to bear with me. I'm not a terribly good public speaker, as some of y'all knew who knew me on the campaign trail. Um, uh, the one thing that I, I, I wanted to come to mention has to do, there was a lot of talk about developing another stadium in Southeast Raleigh. Uh, I, I think... Um, a lot of economists and I would think a, a, a lot of people in general feel that uh, it would be a gentrifying influence that is unnecessary. We have the PNC arena that's that, that's apparently requesting more money. Uh, Interlocal inter funds uh, are used to provide the or go towards the R line if, if I'm if I understand correctly, which isn't necessarily heads and beds. Uh, if that sounds a pretty creative way to use interlocal funds. Um, another thing that I think that would help, uh, in, um, especially in downtown Raleigh, is if there was a way that we could turn some of those interlocal funds to provide housing for the people that are living in the streets. Uh, as there are 7,000 people there, it would be a boon to businesses because the people, can I say an association's name that's not staff? The Downtown Raleigh Alliance has signs that say, real change, not spare change, but there is no evidence of real change. Every year we have more people that are living rough and we don't have the, uh, the shelter space to do that. What are we gonna do when it freezes this summer when you've got 350, uh, space for 350 people uh, and you have sub-freezing temperatures? Are we gonna let them all die? Are we gonna open the gymnasiums in the high schools? There's, there's gotta be a creative way to do that. But before we start doing these big projects uh, like downtown South, we should take care of the affordable housing crisis and we should take care of the people that do no, uh, largely to no fault of their own are in a situation where they can't afford to live in the city. And if we expand uh, and do another gentrification project, especially in uh, Southeast Raleigh, it's gonna bring in retail jobs and it brings some restaurant jobs, but it's gonna, it's, gonna call, it's gonna bring the cost of living in those areas up to where people that have those jobs have a hard time to afford it. Uh, I think we should focus on tackling affordable housing before we do any of these pet destination city projects because we need, we have, we, it is morally incumbent upon us as a city to do what we can to make sure that everybody succeeds. Um, and another thing I just wanted to say that's unrelated, um, there's gonna be people up here that have got pictures of miscarriages and, and I, I personally feel that it's not my position as a man to tell a woman whether or not she can have bodily uh, autonomy. And I think it's important that, uh, it's important to protect women. And so, uh, thank you very much. Next time I will come better prepared. Joshua, thank you. 
Um, Joshua, I just wanted to address a couple of things. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, first off, interlocal funding can only be used for projects that were mentioned, like stadiums or um, facilities, sports facilities, things that bring, like carry aquatic center, whatnot. It cannot, that money by statute cannot be used for affordable housing. However, here's something you might want to know. We are having our very first meeting, um, well, it's a work session on December 17th at 11.30 a.m. here, and it's on housing affordability. So we will start tackling that issue. Um, homelessness um, is an important issue to all of us, and we're all committed to moving forward on that issue. So thank you for being here. Okay, now we have Octavia Rainey, Ms. Rainey. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Octavia. I live at 1516 East Lane Street. I'm standing before you this evening hurt, humiliated, and I would like to read a staffer's comment that was made about me personally to Channel 11 News. And the comments goes like this. Miss Rainey wants to be able to transport transport the neighborhood East College Park back to the 1960s and she wants to see the same people living there. She wants to see the same size and the type and scale of housing. She wants to see the same people living there who lived there in, in the 1960s. Well, time machines don't exist. I would like to comment now. Okay. That was not good for race relations in the city of Raleigh. Is this the reason why the city of Raleigh never built any houses to look like middle-class black neighborhoods? Because you know that's a problem. We build them to look like white neighborhoods. And in East College Park, all the houses look like white neighborhoods. They don't look like black neighborhoods. So. The message that was sent to me, it was a personal attack, and I don't like it, but it was an attack on my people. I love my neighborhood. I've lived there all my life, and I love the people that live there. There was nothing wrong with the 1960s. That's a race, that is a race relation problem here, a race relation. And you know what bothers me? That when you have people in a position of authority, that makes decisions. You allow them to make statements like that? He's not the, that's not the tail that's making that. That's the head. What is wrong with that picture? You know, I watch news across the state. Anybody else who had made a statement like that would be terminated. I mean terminated. They would have been in an uproar. This council should be ashamed that he made that statement about my neighborhood referring to the 1960s, the, the scale and the size. What do he mean by that? Something is wrong here, but anywhere else, anywhere else, they will be terminated for that kind of statement. And when you have people in authority, that is unacceptable to me unacceptable so is this the reason why you never build in the inner city the neighborhoods to look like black middle-class neighborhoods thank you miss rainey next we have keller wright Ms. wright good evening welcome i'm Calla wright uh, 613 cooper road raleigh I'm here to discuss the reuse waste water tower, gentrification, and homelessness. The city's only, one and only reuse waste water tower is located on a cheap piece of land in a black neighborhood. It joins my property and it was initially designed to serve the Raleigh Country Club, uh, which is a segregated white elite club, white only club. I'm here requesting an update on the request made by a council member for the cost for removal. Updates on the water runoff uh, property claim that I submitted and uh, there was someone who came out. However, uh, it seems to have dissipated, no feedback. I'm next uh, also requesting a 
response to the public request that I made regarding the listing of all city-owned property and uh, have, have that request fallen on deaf ears. I wanted to know all of the property that had been sold during the last, uh, since the uh, 19, uh, 1999, and the growth of Raleigh has resulted in extreme loss of land, homelessness at the expense of those who were forced uh, to live here in Southeast Raleigh because of segregation in the 1960s. And now you take your land back and you cause disruption in families. Se segregation versus growth shows disrespecting how you have disrespected and devalued the black citizens in Southeast Raleigh. I highly recommend that the city council receive extensive training in race relations on how to engage in effective conversations when dealing with black brown citizens in Southeast Raleigh. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wright. Next we have David Bobles. This is David Buboltz, 527 Keesler Drive, Cary, North Carolina. This is an admonition to those who previously served on the council and are still here and as a warning for those taking this position. Yesterday, all seven of you council members put your hand on the Bible, giving credence to the holy and living word and the testimony therein, and were asked... Do you solemnly swear to maintain the Constitution of the United States, maintain the Constitution of North Carolina, and to faithfully discharge the duties of your office as a council member in the city of Raleigh, so help me God? The U.S. Constitution says, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law, nor deny any person equal protection under the law. You have failed to provide equal protection under the law by upholding murder statutes for certain ages of people, but not other ages of people. We have been here for months and laid out actions that you could have taken, but instead chose to deprive the life of so many of our children. The North Carolina Constitution says this, We, the people of North Carolina, grateful to Almighty God, the Sovereign of Nations, acknowledge the dependence on Him for the continuance of blessings to us and our posterity. As so, the Constitution of North Carolina recognizes its submission to the King of Kings and the ruler of nations. You are the ones who are in rebellion to the Constitution, but to the sovereign of this nation and the ruler of this city. Repent and believe in the name of Jesus and be saved. The coming of the Lord is at hand. This, he is the one who says he hates the hands that shed innocent blood. You were in positions of power, and yet you have done nothing to stop the bloodshed, and as such, you are responsible. So to that I would say, as your oath says, so help you God. These, these children are of all colors and races Sir, and people. Leave right now. He still had time on his clock. He time. No. He, he is inciting the crowd. We don't allow that. Please. Next time, you will be removed from the chamber, sir, just so you understand. Up, I spoke in my time. My time Peter Firth, next, please. And no exchanges back and forth in the crowd. My name is Peter Firth. I live at 3640 Armida Drive, Wake Forest. 
I come here again tonight to continue to plead for the lives of the most innocent of our society, the unborn children. You have the power to make decisions to create a sanctuary city for the unborn by outlawing abortion in Raleigh. The question is, where do your convictions lie? Do you really care about all people, which would include the unborn, or do you merely just give the appearance of caring for these children? We believe that God created mankind in his image and that human life begins at conception. Our sovereign God forms humans with special dignity, freedoms, and duties for which mankind will be held accountable. Highlighting God's creativity is the fact that each one of us is uniquely created. Every person must have a right to life. Life is sacred. We are, and we are strongly committed to the preservation and defense of the unborn, which compels our moral and ethical duty to defend them from destruction. <coughs> Picture yourself as a child in the womb. Would you not want someone to stand up for you and defend your life, wherein you have no power to do so yourself? Our convictions are not based on any form of man's philosophy or personal feelings that we have concerning life or human existence. Our actions and motivations are based upon the standard of truth that all man must recognize. The truth is God, the creator and preserver of everything that exists, his essence in the, in the trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and the Bible, which is God's revelation of himself to humanity. Mankind doesn't get to determine truth. That alone belongs to God. We are, living, we are to live according to his truth and be obedient to it. So, counsel, what are you going to do about this issue of abortion in your realm of control? God has given you clear guidance in Deuteronomy 21 and 9. It says, so you shall purge all guilt of, innocence, uh, of innocent blood from your midst when you do what is right in the sight of the Lord. And we are told in, in, in Proverbs chapter 6 that God hates the shedding of innocent blood. Do you not know the authority that you have? that there is no authority except from God, and that those, that those exist that have been instituted by God. God placed you in, in your position, and what does, he, what does he expect from you? He has told you in Micah 6, 8, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your Lord. You say that you cannot outlaw abortion. Yes, you can. The question is, will you be obedient to God, turning to him, trusting in him? This is not your battle, it's his. He is looking to us for obedience, which is more important than anything temporal. Next we have Kathy Firth, please. Kathy Firth, 3640 Armida Drive, Wake Forest. Good evening, Mayor members of the council and those that are new here. Um, I, we're here again this month to ask you to end the killing in our city of the innocent and to make Raleigh a sanctuary city for the unborn. Last month it was said that we each have our own truth. I disagree. There is only one source of truth and it's not you and it's not me. That source of truth is the maker and creator of all things God. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John 1, 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. What is the truth about abortion? Since 1973, we have exterminated, it's a horrible word, close to 63 million of our children. In 2017, approximately 18% of U.S. pregnancies ended in abortion. One in four women have had an abortion. 45% of Caucasian women, 54% of African American women have had more than one. We were told abortions would be safe, legal, and rare, and to trust women. We believe the lie. Now 63 million lives are gone. One in four women live with the reality of murder in their past. We stand by and do nothing while children are killed every day in our city. Many nod their approval that a woman's choice supersedes the life of a child. 
Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. The truth that abortion is murder is suppressed. The truth that abortion damages women is suppressed. Our government builds an entire party's platform on the love of death and the massive lie that women deserve the right to kill their children. We are in rebellion and under God's wrath. We must come to the truth about sin and its offensiveness to a holy and righteous God. We must see that our sin is against him, against the truth. We must repent. And I say we. I'm including myself in that. Psalm 51, 3, 4 says, For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Psalm 51, 6, Behold, you delight in truth and the inward being. Psalm 51, 14, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation. Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God. Your you time is up, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Gavin Omelia. My name is Gavin Omelia, 8013 Lakeshore Drive. I'm here today on behalf of the hundreds of, of millions of babies who have been murdered through abortion. And no matter what you call it, a fetus, an embryo, a baby is a baby. There is absolutely no question scientifically that a new human being is formed at conception. The moment that a sperm meets an egg, there's a unique genetic code in a unique human life created. Abortion is a horrendous act of murder and it is the moral duty of you as the city council to pass legislation to make it illegal. Abortion is murder. Killing babies is wrong. It is wrong because the ultimate authority, the creator God, says you shall not murder. It's even wrong by your own standards. The vision statement of the city of Raleigh is to pursue world-class quality of life by actively collaborating with our community towards a fulfilling and inspired future for all. What hypocrisy. You don't want quality of life for all. You are allowing women to murder their own children simply because they don't want them. Where is the baby's quality of life? It's gone, sacrificed on the altar of a woman's convenience and choice. In the name of choice, we commit murder. The council has a moral duty to make abortion illegal. I would ask today that you pass legislation to criminalize abortion. We don't want a heartbeat bill. We don't want to regulate abortion. We want to end all abortion at any age. We want the most severe criminal penalty possible for anyone who for any reason murders a baby before, during, or after birth. We would also like to change the zoning laws to disallow any building that would provide abortions either surgically, by medication, or otherwise. If you as the council do nothing to prevent abortion, then you are complicit in the murder of children. And you will be held accountable. If not now, then on judgment day before the throne of God. Repent. God is holy and just. And our sin is rebellion against God. The just penalty for our rebellion is eternal damnation in a lake of fire. But God, because of his great love, sent his only begotten son. Jesus, he lived the perfect life that we failed to live, and he died the death that we rightfully deserved. God put all the punishment for our sin upon Jesus and imputed to us his righteousness. And he didn't stay dead. On the third day, Jesus rose from the dead, conquering sin, Satan, and death. Repent and believe in him. I beg you, end abortion now. Keegan. Keegan Omelia, 8013 Lakeshore Drive. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. What determines right from wrong? Who decides bullying, lying, raping, and murder are wrong? All these things are wrong because God says they're wrong. But what about you? How do you determine what is acceptable and right? God says murder is wrong, but it is allowed every day here in Raleigh. You don't call it murder. But changing the name 
doesn't change the action. Without God, murder is acceptable. Why would it be wrong to kill me? I am, in fact, younger than you. I am less developed than you, and I still depend on my parents. How do you decide when it's acceptable to murder and when it's completely wrong? Abortion is murder, and the city council needs to make abortion illegal in Raleigh. Babies are humans, created by God. People celebrate babies in the womb by having baby showers. By calling them baby showers, we are acknowledging the fact that babies in the womb are humans. No one calls them fetus showers or a clump of cell showers. You don't ask a pregnant woman who wants her child how her fetus is doing. But suddenly, when a woman does not want her child, it is no longer a baby but a clump of cells. Feelings do not change facts. God says in Psalm 139, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Babies are created by God, and he commands us not to murder. Babies are dependent on their mothers, but life isn't determined by dependency. Children with special needs depend on their caregivers to stay alive, but they are just as alive as me and you. People on feeding tubes depend on them to survive, but they have every right to live. People on life support depend on life support to live, but we have no right to murder them. How are babies in the womb any different? The city council needs to make abortion illegal. It's your duty to protect. You don't get to decide who you protect. Without God's standard, there is no right or wrong. But we have God's standard, and he says do not murder. We all sin. We hurt others, we hurt ourselves, and we make mistakes. We deserve to be thrown in a fire, separated from God forever. But God, in his love and his mercy, sent his son to earth to live a perfect life we fail to live every single day and die on a cross for our sins. If we repent and believe today, we can be saved and have eternal life with God. So I beg you today to repent. I ask tonight you stop and think about all the children that you've allowed to be slaughtered and continue to be slaughtered every day. And take a moment and reflect about how special God made every baby. And instead of protecting them and treasuring them, people, please decorum. In between speakers, stop the applause. Please. Thank you. Ken Cheeseman, 107 November Street. Council, I'm here today to demand that you make Raleigh a sanctuary city for the preborn. Uh, it's Christmas time. Luke 2 is a good story for Christmas. The setting is this there's an angel talking to some shepherds. He says this, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling, swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among, them, among whom he is pleased. Now you might have heard this last uh, verse 14 as glory to God in the highest. The King James Version says, And on earth peace good will towards men you might have seen this in the charlie brown christmas special you might have you might have heard this in songs but the best translations the most modern translations with the best greek text agree that it should be on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased counsel jesus is not pleased with your actions Jesus clarifies he does grow up, he does have a ministry, and in Matthew 10, he says this, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. He goes on, And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Council, in this text, we find a few things. The first coming of Jesus will bring peace with those that please God. 
Again, counsel, you're not pleasing God. Out of the one of the six things that God hates, the hands that shed innocent blood, and there is blood on your hands today. How can you please God when you allow the most innocent to be murdered? The first coming in Jesus will bring peace, will not bring peace, but a sword. And Jesus is talking about division. He's saying, he's drawing a clear line. He's saying, what line, what side are you on? And today, we want you to be on the side of life and following after God. Finally, the first coming of Jesus does bring hope and peace. And counsel, you have a time, you have a chance to know Jesus, to repent from your sin, and follow him. Thank you. Next, we have Zach Birdie. Good evening, City Council. My name is Zach Brady. I live at 8528 Plymouth Hill Drive in Wake Forest. I've come here to ask you to show mercy on Raleigh's smallest citizens, unborn children. In Matthew 5, Jesus states, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. That is, for those who are willing to show mercy to others, mercy will also be shown to them. Christians, perhaps more than anyone else, understand and value this truth. You see, Christians have been shown the mercy of God through their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We who were once enemies of God and children of wrath have now been made friends of God and children adopted into his family. Our sin that once separated us from God and demanded death has now been forgiven because of Jesus laying down his life on Calvary's cross. God's justice was poured out on Christ so that his mercy could be lavished on undeserving sinners like you and like me. And because Christians have been the recipients of such a great mercy, we too, realizing the mercy that we have been shown, can now show mercy to others. Just as Jesus showed mercy by healing the sick, by feeding the hungry, and by dying for condemned sinners, so Christians following in Christ's footsteps are now called to show mercy on the weak and helpless in their own societies. Over the centuries, Christians, at great risk to themselves, have courageously and mercifully spoken up to tyrannical governments for their neighbors who could not speak for themselves. It was Christians like William Wilberforce who stood against Parliament and brought about the end of human trafficking in England. Christians filled the abolitionist societies, ignoring Dred Scott and the Fugitive Slave Act, helping to lead the charge that would end the American slave trade. Christians like Dietrich Bonhoeffer gave their lives as they spoke out against Hitler and the evils of the Nazi party. And it will be Christians, led by the Spirit of God, who will lead the charge that will bring about the end of the Holocaust that we see here in Raleigh, which is abortion. We have come here tonight to beg that you would show mercy on the children of Raleigh, defenseless babies, six days a week are being massacred on your watch. Their arms and legs are being ripped off, their intestines are being pulled from their abdomens, and their heads are being severed from their bodies. Where is the indignation, city council? Where is the sense of justice? Where is mercy? Where is it? We've been coming here since uh, April, and nothing from any of you. Where is your mercy? You have the ability to enact ordinances in this city that would make it impossible for a woman's choice or a preferred women's health center to open their doors tomorrow morning. It's your duty as lesser magistrates to obey God and to protect those whom God has placed in your authority. And sometimes obedience to God is disobedience to men, even men that are in black robes sitting in our nation's capital. You're called to disobey men if they tell you to disobey God. God demands that you govern your people with righteousness, justice, and mercy. James 2.13 says, For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. City Council, trust me when I say you need God's mercy. We all do. I pray that God would move in your hearts to show mercy on these innocent children, that in turn God will also show mercy to you as he grants you repentance of sins and faith in his Son, Jesus Christ. Do the right thing. Govern justly. Show mercy. Make Raleigh a sanctuary city for unborn children. Next, we have Lucas Brady. Hi, my name is Lucas Brady. I live at 8528 Plymouth Hill Drive, Wake Forest, and I'm here to speak on behalf of the lives of innocent children in our city. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, it states one of the commandments, and that is, do not murder. And you are allowing the murder of innocent children here in Raleigh by allowing abortion to happen. Abortion may be legal here, but it is breaking God's law. According to God, abortion is murder. You know this because God has written his law on your heart. God gave you a conscience for a reason. God has also given you this responsibility as a council, city council member to protect the people in Raleigh. I would like to ask you to use your authority wisely so that you will not be punished by God for allowing the killing of children, which is a great sin against 
God. We are all sinners, but the good news is God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to, and to forgive us of all of our sins. So turn from your sins and trust in Jesus, and God will forgive you from your sins. Picture somebody when you were in the womb of your mother using metal instruments to rip your, you apart. Would you like somebody to do that to you? No, of course not. On the day of judgment, God will punish the governing officials who had the power to stop this but did nothing. So I am begging you to do what you can to stop this because God says it is wrong and I am sad to live in a city that thinks treating people this way is okay. I will pray for each of you that you come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and that you will love and want to protect these children made in his image. Thank you for your time today. And then we have LaShonda Williams. Greetings to each of you. I am LaShonda Williams, 3300 Idlewood Village Drive, Raleigh, North Carolina. I would like to thank all of you for the opportunity to stand before you this evening and to speak on behalf of those who have no voice. You have heard, heard many others speak on the sanctity of life and how it matters to the God of the Bible what actions you as Raleigh City Council will take in regard to making Raleigh a sanctuary city for the unborn. And I do not mean to worry you with redundancy. However, I have one more expression to deliver. I invite you to listen closely to the words that shall follow. Just let me live, mommy, please. I promise that the late nights will be worth it. I promise that my loud cries are only temporary. I cry loud and hard because I need you. I'm preparing my lungs for talking to you so that one day I can say with a loud voice, I love you, mommy, because I do. Just let me live, mommy, please. I promise that the money spent on food and diapers will be worthwhile. You are preparing me to become an effective and contributory citizen of the blessed America. I look forward to looking you in the eyes and you realizing how much I resemble you. Just let me live, mommy, please. I promise I will smile, laugh, and giggle when you tickle the bottom of my feet. I promise I will go to sleep when you gently rub my head and hold, hold me close to your bosom. Just let me live, mommy, please. My life matters and your life matters, which is why grandmommy kept you. Just let me live, mommy, please. I promise I will make you smile when I bring home the spelling bee champion award from school. I promise I will make you proud. Just let me live, mommy, please. Even though I may begin in folly, I won't stay there if you train me. Just let me live, mommy, please. I won't be a nuisance, mommy. Trust me. If you really don't want me, then give me up for adoption, mommy, but please don't kill me. Please don't let that strange, wicked man or that strange, wicked woman with medical doctor credentials suck me out and rip me from your uterine wall. Please just let me live, mommy. Jesus Christ lives, mommy, and because he lives, I promise we can face tomorrow. Just let me live, mommy, please. Just let me live, mommy, please. Just let me live, mommy, please. You've just heard a black baby's plea from the womb, a plea to you, city council men and women, to honor the sanctity of life and to recognize the unborn as human beings also with un un unalienable rights like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you kindly for your time and your considerations. Thank you very much. And now we move to matters scheduled for public hearing. Um, first, I'd like to ask who is here to speak for the con on the consolidated plan? Could you raise your hand? Okay, is there any? Okay, um, two minutes per side, or per um, speaker. And um, Nikki, will you, um, well, thank you. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. So tonight we're gonna to talk about the consolidated plan, and this is the first of two public hearings. So the consolidated plan sets goals and priorities for community development and housing needs. Uh, it identifies strategies, resources, and networks to address those needs, and it essentially functions as our application for federal funding. So up until today, we've had five public meetings, and tonight we are at our needs public hearing, and that means we would like to hear from the community on the needs of community development and housing. In winter 2020, we are projected to have a draft consolidated plan and we will have a public meeting to talk about that draft. Uh, we anticipate being back in front of council in April 2020 to have the second public hearing and hopefully council adoption in May 2020. I'd like to draw council's attention to the highlighted areas in the 80% row. 
I just wanted to draw council's attention to this because th these are the folks that we are really serving, 80% and below. So who exactly do we serve? Homeowners, home buyers, renters, people experiencing homelessness, job seekers, and nonprofits. Uh, we are funded in several different ways. Through federal grants, we receive community development block grant funds, home investment partnership funds, and emergency solution grants. Uh, in addition to that, we also receive money from a property tax that council adopted uh, several years ago, Penny for Housing. And before I conclude the presentation, I want to talk about some of the impacts that we've made over the past five years. Uh, an example here is Washington Terrace. I'm sure some of you have heard about this. Uh, 162 one, two, and three bedroom apartments. Booker Park North, 72, one, two, three bedroom apartments. Uh, some uh, focusing on the elderly and the others focusing on family. In total, between FY16 and 19, I don't think you can see it, we've actually constructed 1,497 units and preserved in four years. And I'd, I'd like to add without anybody being displaced. Absolutely. In addition to that, uh, East College Park, we've completed 36 homes. And finally, as it relates to homelessness, uh, the City Council invested $3.1 million into Oak City Cares. Uh, this facility is designed to connect families and individuals to services, uh, to make that experience more seamless, if you will. In addition to that, with our ESG funds between 16 and 19, we've helped 401 families or individuals with rapid rehousing. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Anybody with questions? Okay. Um, who's here to speak? Okay. Miss Rainey, All right. you're back. Come on. I'm back. I'm back. My name is Octavia, and my address is 1516 Lane Street. First of all, I want to talk about this. Under the consolidated plan, you have the citizen participation plan, which is a part of HUD process. There's a total of 14 or maybe 1,500 citizen participation plan. I have read a total of 700. And Raleigh has not brought their citizen participation plan out to even be discussed. So that's a problem. Number two, the community development department did a study which cost $9,500. And it was a study, a housing study, and it was combined with the neighborhood revitalization strategy. Department has never brought that study out today. And I would like to see that study because that study, part of it is about my community. So it's very important that we get this straight about the consolidated plan. Another part of the consolidated plan is the analysis of impediment. The city so far is working on it, but I think the city is doing a terrible job with the analysis of impediment. The analysis of impediment is a local review of your policies, your procedures, your administrative rules that gets you to fair housing choice. So how can you have the consolidated plan if you aren't talking about those, those issues? I have 35 years in housing. So I, I have a deep concern here. I also wanna talk about your affordable housing. The city do 50 to 60% of the area's median income. Under the area's median income with 60%, a three bedroom is $1,000. That's not affordable. That's your middle income housing. I don't see the city working on affordable. Affordable is 30% or below. So I don't see the contrast of you working with Raleigh Housing Authority at all. Thank you, Ms. Rainey. You're welcome. Next. Hi, my name is Nancy Pierce, 3452 South Beaver Lane, Raleigh. Mr. Branch, I'm in your district. Um, I've lived here 23 years, and every few years I take a look at the city's consolidated plans and priorities as outlined. Um, what I see there consistently is an omission of addressing some of our citizens, that is, adults with developmental disabilities. Usually just a sentence is devoted to saying something special uh, about, about special needs housing. 
The report card in my 23 years, however, is a C minus or D minus to the city of Raleigh. Um, sure, go ahead and strategize for the homeless, that's fine. Um, I work in 11 states in low-income housing tax credits and have done so for about 25 years. I've underwritten probably 200 of those. It is a wonderful program for leveraging local resources. But I'd like to invite you to think outside the box. Many of you ran on the campaign about affordable housing. I make my living from it but I'd like you to think outside the box. In the 1970s, from what I can find, uh, the city appropriated from the general fund uh, funds for DHIC for operating subsidies. They do a fine job. Would you consider opening business type incubators to other nonprofits who will address the needs of other special needs housing? Some of the, you awarded uh, affordable, we awarded you affordable housing bonds we voted on years ago. It took a while to deploy that. The last thing I'd like to say is keep going on processes here. I work a lot of architects that have a lot of delays and I have one some right now. Um, so uh, thank you for the great job you're gonna be doing. Thank you for all of your personal sacrifices. Appreciate it. Thank you for being here. And um, Nikki, could could you um, address that um, that issue with um, disabilities and housing? Absolutely, we'll take the comment, make sure it's noted, and uh, we'll look into it. Okay, we'll report and then, back as well. Second um, public hearing. Miss Rainey also had some um, questions for information back. Could you just report that back to um, us, the city manager's report, and update? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you so much. Anybody else? Hi, I'm Melanie Paul. I am a Raleigh native. I am right now living in Nightdale because I had to buy an affordable house to be able to house people who are homeless, and I've been doing that for 10 years. Uh, we went together with 21 different nonprofits, individuals, and businesses have formed a collaboration of, non of us. We all live, work in Raleigh. We live in Wake County, and we've come together to create a solution for how those who are homeless or in transition or are displaced. We're proposing a win-win between the city of Raleigh and Southeast Raleigh residents. The majority of us have had these life experiences and have overcome them, and we are now coming together to assist others who find themselves on the paths we once were. We have put together our collaborative plan, which continues to grow and expand. I've got a copy if anybody wants it. This program is different from any out there that we know of in that it focuses on healing the whole person, allowing time to learn new vocational and entrepreneurial skills. We are helping to rebuild an individual's core foundation and giving them the support and skills to succeed as opposed to putting them in a minimum wage job and continuing the cycle. Um, we would like the opportunity to partner with the city and be part of the five-year plan as it was put together to end homelessness. Housing is a key component to this program. I've done this for 10 years and I work with other people who have done this as well. Um, and we want to see how we can partner together on this and if we can follow a schedule up meeting to be part of the five-year plan i don't know what if you allow that or what that looks like um if you could um leave your name um and contact information with the clerk okay. we will provide that to um nikki awesome thank you okay thank you so much for being here who else would like to speak on the consolidated Mayor, plan yes could I just, um to the individual that just spoke i Missed your first name. If I could get a copy of the report that you mentioned, that'd be great. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, well, just share it with the entire council. We'll yeah, send we'll it share to everybody. it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Mary, and I live at uh, 3413 Cherry Lane in Raleigh. And I'm here to speak about this uh, consolidation and the five year plan, and then we had the HUD um, assessment something or other and everything was so jumbled i went to more than one meeting and came away with information regarding um hud needing to put this together for five years and then finding out that of the four meetings i went to and the consultants that were brought in that we paid for we in wake county and carrie they met with less than 100 people 
And I think that that's really seriously something wrong with that, that they met with less than 100 people and they were, did not meet with anyone with Oak City Cares. This was a particular having to do with homelessness and affordable housing. Um, didn't seem to know that, for, uh, that Oak City Cares existed. I understand that they got a list of places to go to. But my concern was with this organization that was uh, c consulting and paid for to do this HUD plan. At the same time, we're doing something with the city. And I do want to say that um, I really hope uh, that each of you will think outside the box. This lady who spoke before me, that sounds fantastic. So excited to hear that people are doing things that don't necessarily require, but you know, we all have input in with our city and our and our you know we care. And there isn't one size that fits all. Okay, these the the housing income tax credits. I have a friend who has gone to multiple times to go put in her application, and she has to pay twenty five dollars each time. Guess what? She finally got to the top of the list. She has an eviction from three years ago. Every time she went to one of these LHIC places to put an application in, she was, um, the money was taken. Now, CASA does a fantastic job. I hope that you all will work more with CASA. We're planning on doing personally myself and um, small well, houses. Your time is up, but Everybody, thank you for thank being you. here. Thank and you for your time, each of you. If there's any follow-up necessary, okay. Who, could you raise your hand if you still want to speak on this issue? You, who else? One, three. two, three. Okay, if we could get ready to, to go. Sir, why don't you take a seat down there, so. Good evening, my name is Cheyenne Kramer and I'm currently at 832 Let's Relief Place in Wendell. 10 years ago this month, um, my husband and I experienced part of the foreclosure crisis, and if it hadn't been for a family member, we would have been amongst the homeless. We know that having uh, several months to be able to collect our thoughts with that family member and to figure out our next steps and where we needed to go from there was absolutely critical in being able to reinvent and rebuild our lives. And so we're here with a very special request. This is related to Ms. Paul's uh, talking about this idea. We want to see a residential, entrepreneurial, and vocational training incubator here in Raleigh. And we believe we can raise funds to be able to do some of the actual programming and even some rehab work. But we have a very special request for the council. And I know that this goes outside a lot of current thinking, and we understand this. Uh, but there are empty buildings right now sitting on the Dix campus that we are requesting with all our hearts that be looked at as a possible short-term solution for helping some of our residents here in Raleigh. Because there's, there's a, a building such as at 900 Richardson Drive that looks like it could be an awesome place to be able to house some people temporarily to start this vocational and entrepreneurial training process. It also would appear that there is a church building that is not in use on the property right now that could be used to start to put together these training programs. Uh, between Melanie and I, I've been teaching in homeless shelters. I have been teaching the formerly incarcerated community. I've been teaching our at-risk youth um, entrepreneurial skills, career development skills, and we have a whole team of 22 women who are ready to go to do this kind of work. We're just asking for your assistance. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me, I've had a cold, so my voice is a little off, but sir, you are up next. Good evening. My name is Willie Stokes, 320 Maple Street, Raleigh. Uh, is this on? All right. Um, I'm here with the concerns about there's a garden in College Park named John Stokes, and I think the the city have in their plans to eliminate that park. Uh, the community has been decimated by the buildings and as Mrs. Rainey uh, mentioned earlier about how things are changed. We don't mind change, but being pushed out is a different situation. We, uh, I think we, we may be in the way, but we 
I've been, I was born there 76 years ago, and I don't mind change, but there's a park named after my uncle that was dedicated to him doing work, all, not only in that park, but all over Southeast Raleigh. And it seems that he's in the way nobody knows him, at least the people don't know him that want that property and to, so they can have a big house or something, you know. But we like to celebrate John Stokes. And so we want to keep some of the things that we fought for ourselves. We are not the just standing around doing nothing. We, we had a community that was self-sufficient. So uh, I think now that no one came to the people that live in that community to ask them their opinion. So we are, I'm through. Thank you, sir. I'll, I'll, <clears throat> I'll also, uh, I'm Barbara Smalley McMahon, 602 North Bloodworth Street. I'll also speak to the park, but I want to speak to it from a perspective that you may not have thought of. Um, there's a quote in the African American Museum in, uh, in D.C., and the quote says that despite daily denials of their humanity, enslaved African Americans sustained a vision of freedom by making prayer, family, dance, and even work their own. They built their own identities. Basketball is a part of the African American identity. It is what has been played for decades at the park that was just mentioned in, in uh, East College Park. And that's what I want to talk to you about right now. I want, to talk, I want to help you connect the dots between mental health issues and identity issues. I worked as a therapist for 30 years. A lot of the people I worked with had suicidal and homicidal depression, suffered from anxiety. At the root of all of that is a lack of a sense of one's own identity as a human being. It's very true that dance and prayer and worship and um, the food and the, the sports, the best, all of that is part of the cultural identity of the African American people who have in large part been left out of the process. Uh, like the woman who spoke a few minutes ago said, in the community <coughs> meetings, less your, than 100 your time people is up, showed up from your the time community. Is up, please. Their Thank voices you. need to be heard. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Um, I think um, Ms. Small um, was the last one to speak on this issue. Um, Mayor's excuse to deal with our um, cold. We're now going to move to our, we're closing the hearing on the five-year consolidated plan. Um, all that information will be taken back um, and a report will be given out. As far as Carver Street Park, I, the last time I looked at it, that park was not going away, but I will follow up unless, Nikki, you have a statement to make? That's true, Mr. Branch. Uh, Mr. Stokes, we don't intend on moving the Stokes Park at all. As a matter of fact, we plan on upgrading it. Okay, so thank you for that. Um, next, we will move on to um, item number two, our sidewalk petition, Brighton Road. Hello, um, I am Jason Myers in the Department of Transportation. I wanted to um, give council the opportunity to, to hear these slides or not, sometimes those aren't desired, but I do wanna make sure that we, I point out how item two is very different than three and four. And so that's a main part of this, this presentation. And that the first item is a sidewalk petition. And this is a petition for uh, ins installation of sidewalks in neighborhood street 
There are no assessments for sidewalk installations through this program, but the streets must have curb and gutter. The next two items, the streets do not have curb and gutter, and so there are assessments. Um, in this program, <clears throat> excuse me, um, one property gets one vote, and that those votes are tallied either by online or by mailing in a ballot. And the threshold for success for us to come to this public hearing is that 50% plus one of the respondents are in support of the project, and those who do not respond are not counted in that majority um, in that majority calculation. So this first Brighton Road sidewalk petition is in the kind of inside the Beltline, Northeast Raleigh, um, near Glasscock and Raleigh Boulevard. Uh, the scope of the project, and again, that's a part of Council District C, uh, the scope of the project is about 1,950 linear feet of sidewalk on one side of the street. Uh, the, the tentative plan would be to do a five foot sidewalk, about three and a half foot from the back of the curb, um, and that it would vary from the east side to the west side. In one block, it'd be on the, the east. On the other two blocks, it would be on the west. Uh, it's estimated tentatively for just construction costs, about $140,000, and again, there's no assessments. So what that looks like in the context of the neighborhood, these blue lines, and we're playing with different maps that show up well on this, this venue here, um, are a rough inventory of our existing sidewalks. The orange is the proposed sidewalk as a part of the project running from um, Glasscock North to Millbank Street, which is near Raleigh Boulevard. And then you can also see the Greenway, uh, Crabtree Creek uh, Greenway Trail is off on the, um, the east of this side. Um, the results of the petition of the 37 uh, properties that were petitioned, 15 responded, and of those 15, 12 were voting yes, and only three voted no. So we have two pie charts here. One is showing just of the responses, showing 80% support. The other is it's going to put in that context of the number of total properties that are out there. Um, and so I have uh, some maps and some, some street view if that's helpful, but I can take questions and you can open the public hearing if there are none. Any questions from any counselors for staff? Okay, at this time what we'll do, we'll open the public hearing. How many people are here to speak on this sidewalk issue? All right, so I see three. Um, so what we'll do is we'll do, um, we'll keep the pattern two minutes per side. It's our zoning cases that have the standard um, time frame for each side. So each individual for this, um, I'll let you come down and speak three minutes. First, those who are for, two minutes, those who are for the sidewalk can come down, please. Please state your name and your address. Uh, Nicholas Ayala, 1149 Brighton Road. Um, I'm the one that uh, submitted the uh, request to get the sidewalk put in. Um, I've only been living there for about two years. Uh, I walk my dog uh, almost every single day, uh, ride my bike. Uh, and I see plenty of pedestrians uh, walking down the street. Um, unfortunately, there are no sidewalks, but it is a street that has heavy traffic. Um, a lot of people tend to uh, cut through Brighton Road uh, all the way to North King Charles Road. Um, not sure why, but we uh, do see a lot of traffic on that back street. Uh, I've even submitted a petition to get um, speed humps put in place, uh, and it looks like uh, we did qualify in order to get those done. Um, it'll be I don't know how many years before uh, that actually gets done, but uh, we're wanting to install these sidewalks in order to uh, at least have somewhere to walk and not be in the way of all these cars coming by. Uh, a lot of people tend to speed throughout that street too, so. Okay, all right, thank you. Anyone else here to speak for the sidewalks? <laughs> let, me, let me get back to you. Um, I had another hand for gentlemen wanting to speak against the sidewalks, or did you have, we're talking about Brighton Street sidewalk. So Josh, you had a question, it's part of the hearing, so you still have two minutes to speak on this subject. Yeah, I don't need two minutes. Uh, it, it just the presentation said that it was the, the property owners are the ones that could vote, but since sidewalks and stuff would potentially affect people that are renting as well, 
do the renters have any input in this one? I'm not speaking for or against it. It's not near where I am. I'm that, just I, Thank you. That. And I think that's a subject that's been brought up that we're reviewing right now as far as the participation of those that are uh, Okay, because there but are right people now, who live in long places. Everything goes out to property owners because that's where we have written information from the clerk where okay. they can pull from. Okay. But thank you. All right. If there's nothing else to be said on this, I'll bring this one back to the council table. Um, can I get the vote back up again? Okay, so it's 80% for, 20% um, against of those that responded. Okay. Um, council, any questions, comments? Um, we, we have to work to bridge the gap. And for that, I vote that we move forward with the sidewalk petition. Second. Right. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries, and I turn it back over to our mayor. You take the next one. Okay. All right. So <laughs> it's back to me. Next, we will have sidewalk street and sidewalk petition for Aberdeen Drive. Yes, thank you. And again, I'm Jason Myers with the uh, Department of Transportation. This, as I said earlier, or alluded to earlier, is different. This is a street improvement petition. This does include a sidewalk. Um, this program is for local streets upon request, not necessarily a resident request, which is actually also true for sidewalks, um, but it does carry with it an assessment. So it's a very different type of petition. Um, the assessment rate is $32 foot per, $30 per linear foot of frontage for residential property and twice that for non-residential frontage. It can include a sidewalk, this one and the next one do, but that is not a requirement of the policy at this point. Only property owners can sign that petition. And um, the threshold, there's two of them simultaneously. It's the majority of the properties affected and the majority of the frontage affected. Um, so this is for Aberdeen Road, which is in um, kind of inside just a little bit south of the last one um, near the Walnut Creek, um, Walnut Creek where it crosses Rose Lane. The uh, scope of this is to turn what's currently a dirt road of about 800 linear feet into a city standard street with sidewalk on one side, about 27 foot back to back um, curb is curb and gutter street as we, we call it, um, with a sidewalk on the east side only. The estimated cost of that is about $760,000 and the assessments at that $32 per linear foot are estimated to be about $41,000. Um, zooming in a little bit in the context of the area, um, Aberdeen Drive is a dead end street off of Rose Lane. And you can see at the end of Rose Lane is where the Walnut Creek Greenway Trail comes through. There are some um, parks and, and other streets with sidewalks in the neighborhood. In this one, 10 properties were affected. Um, six signed the petition. Not signing the petition is effectively um, saying no. There's no way to sign it no. You just keep it at home if you if you don't want this um, so so non responses are also no um, and those that 60% of the properties represent 76% of the linear frontage so it reached the threshold for um, to get to this point I'm going to zoom in on this map a little bit this shows conceptually what those improvements would look like um, with the curb and gutter there would have to be some kind of turnaround at the end of the street. Um, this shows a T turnaround. It could be something else that has not been engineered or designed. Um, and that would bring with it some right away acquisition costs that are not a part of the construction cost estimate that was, that was done by engineering services. Um, and then the check marks on here are the properties who did return the petition in the affirmative. And I can answer any questions. I have a couple questions. The first one, sure. was this project initiated via petition or is it part of our CIP? It was requested by a property owner. I believe property owner number three um, was the one that, that requested, but it was requested by somebody or was not city initiated. Okay, so they requested a sidewalk or? or I believe that the original, well, it, it is a dirt street. It's right. basically an unpaved street. And I think that the, the original request was to do a paving petition, which is an $8 per linear foot assessment to pave a dirt street. That's a one-time thing where the city will not then repave that street again. Uh, and when it became understood that if they later did a, uh, a cur this, this process, there would still be a $32 a linear foot. The, the request was to just go straight to that. You get the paving in the curb and gutter for the $32 rather than doing a one-time paving of $8. Okay. And because it's a petition, that's why the assessment is there yes okay 
And I, I have a couple questions, Jason. Um, sure. For my own edification, excuse my ignorance. Could you go back to the slide uh, that has the cost breakdown for what the assessment would be? Um, for just for, so that I understand, um, I understand the cost per linear foot. The estimated total of forty-one thousand would that be split amongst the property owners on that street, or is that per? Yes. No. Okay. That that's a, if you sum up all of their individual assessments, that's the estimate of what the total would be. Fantastic. Thank you. And then if you go back to the last slide of um, the T proposal, is that if it were redesigned and engineered in a different manner? could potentially be more than what is currently estimated or I'm going to defer to my colleague who will lead this design. I'm also not trying to make this difficult. No, Sorry. It, no, it's, a, it is a good question, but I want to make sure it's answered. Sure. Thank you. Answered I appreciate it. I think it. this is the minimum probably, but okay. I'll let Brennan answer. Right. Brennan Fuquay with engineering services. Um, we showed the T because it was the least, enc it encroached the least on the surrounding property owners. Uh, putting a cul-de-sac is a much larger, um, design. You could also look at K turnarounds, but it's all uh, dictated by codes to get fire trucks or emergency vehicles in there um, and out as safely as possible. So, but yes, this is the least impactful, both monetarily and um, surrounding properties. Great, thank you very much. Any more questions? Yeah, Couple I have questions. A, yeah. Do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, Jeff, I'll just be real brief. Uh, how long has this road been there uh, unpaved? I am not certain about how long it has been there. And I was just uh, curious, I mean, it, is it on a list to be as a city initiated project at all? I No, it is not on a, on a list for a city initiated project. And I could answer the question based on the ages of these houses, um, roughly when that was put in. Um, I believe it was at least before 1981 when the street was, was in existence and maybe much older. Um, if it's important for me to get that answer, I can during the public hearing. Well, I was just wondering, you know, to distinguish this between a petition, obviously it's a petition initiated project, but I was wondering why it wouldn't have been on a list for a city initiated project. Given that it's a dead end, it's not something that we, we don't generally prioritize streets that serve just, just the local community as highly as something that will serve a larger proportion of the city. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just given limited resources. I think we'd love to have all of our streets up to these standards with sidewalks, um, but we, we're not able to do that with a CIP. Okay. Yeah. And also, Councilman Cox, I'm aware of some conversations I've had with um, Michael Moore, the director, of them looking at a program options. We have, I think, six miles of unpaved streets in Raleigh, of try and they don't meet our requirements based on width or whatever circumstance on trying to find a plan to go in and pave these streets. So I do know transportation is looking into something from that standpoint. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good to go. Um, two questions. One, just maybe a point of clarification. So, if someone didn't return the, if they didn't sign, return the petition, they're going to show up as a no on here because there was no. So, yes, sir. We have no way to really tell if the four folks on the street are actually opposed to it or just didn't pay attention to the petition or turn it back. You do the same thing if you're opposed as if you you weren't paying attention. Okay. We have no way of and then the other question I had was about the assessment per, uh, I think it's linear. Um, What's the term? The linear foot of street frontage. So if the total uh, estimation is 41,000, it's not really 41,000 divided by 10, so it would be four, it would, it's going to be um, based on how much street front you have. Exactly. And is there, do we know, and this may be too much for right now, do we know how much of that is the four properties that didn't return or could be no, how much of that, like, are they the bigger one? Like, I can we tell do. it's the two front ones and the two at the end, but do we know how much it would be for them? I can just barely read this on the screen. Property number one, which is on the north east corner, is about approximately 200 foot of frontage. The next one in, which was also no response, was 100 feet of frontage. And then the other two properties are at the very end, and they're a very short section of frontage, one of which is a Duke Energy um, infrastructure facility and then the other one is a property that fronts mostly on rose lane um, and i think that's got about 90 feet of frontage if i'm not mistaken um, but the ones at the end if you change that design is that going to change the number of frontage they have the turnaround thing i do not believe so that's all i have okay any more questions for staff a question please um is it unusual for us to put sidewalks on a dead end street Uh, 
Um, I want to say that we've had a few recent sidewalk petitions that have been on dead end streets. Now, some of those have had some sort of destination at the end, or um, but but not. Um, can you answer that question? No, it, exactly like you said. There's been some, but they usually have some sort of transportation facility at the end of the street or yeah. school. Or school. Yeah, yeah. It, we do. Re if if you were to build a new dead end street today as a part of subdivision, which is allowed up to a certain length in most of our zoning districts, you would be you wouldn't be required to put in sidewalks on both sides of the street and constructing constructing that. So it's not unusual to have a sidewalk and dead end street. It's not necessarily common for us to get petition pro projects on dead end streets, but it but it does happen. One follow up. Is there any transportation elements at the end of this street? Uh, any any connections that need to be made? I, I don't think so. Um, there is a very long term potential that there could be some redevelopment out there. There's another um, I will go to this. You'll see that there's another street Sherwood Avenue that, that points at it. And if the Duke Energy facility is in between were to be removed and be subdivided, then those two streets would connect and then it would be a through street. But we don't really presume that, that a, a substation is going to be going anywhere for the, for the time being. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, at this time, we're going to open up the hearing. Um, again, two minutes um, for th those that want to speak on this sidewalk. Please come forward. State your name and address, please. My name is O'Hara Powell, 1551 Atria Circle, 604-27604. I kind of have a question for you. The first one you said that there was going to be no assessments. So you're ask, I guess y'all were asking them for funding for it in some way, shape, or form. So is your question about? The, the first project because there's an, uh, an assessment on the second one now the assessment on the second one is 41 some odd thousand dollars on a 760 thousand dollar project without acquisition of more right away 2014 July 2014 I subdivided one piece of land it was 0.15 I mean 0.56 acres I had to pay the city of Raleigh 31 thousand some odd dollars just to subdivide it for a curb, gutter, and a sidewalk. It's still the world's most expensive ditch you've ever seen out there. What compounds that problem is I'm a licensed utility contractor, I'm a licensed highway contractor, and I'm a licensed commercial contractor, residential houses, whatever. I wasn't even given the opportunity to build my own stuff. But yet and still, we're almost five and a half years later, and there's nothing done. So is your question about Aberdeen Road? Well, just just why would y'all consider funding for this instead of giving a citizen who's already paid for there something? Sir, I think we need more information on your particular issue to really address it at this time. So if you could reach out to us, we'll try to address it. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. So anyone here to speak on Aberdeen Road sidewalk, please come forward. I'm Steve Kande. I live uh, on Aberdeen Drive, and uh, I would like to talk about uh, the petition. I know it has been initiated by someone on our street, but uh, we came together and we we saw that we needed the sidewalk. And uh, according to what I know, everybody is waiting for the building of the the, the construction of the street with the sidewalk, because there is a curve, and uh, with the children, there is no way for them to, to be walking on the street. That's why we think that uh, sidewalk would be better for us to come together with, in the package with uh, the construction of the street. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. So anyone else here to speak on this sidewalk, Aberdeen Road? Uh, yes, my name is Michael Ray, and I'm at 525. My property is at the end of Aberdeen, and um, I just want to know that um, is there going to be an uh, outlet where I can get into on the end of my property? Um, that's my concern. And um, we need light back there as well. 
So your question is, would you be able to, to get access in and out of my property on the back side? Well, this part is just dealing with the sidewalk, so I'm not sure about asset, your access. Okay, I just want to know. Yeah, because you should not be, your access to get in and get out as it is today should be the same after the sidewalk is implemented. Okay, is it, I'm asking, is this, this going to be higher, um, be brought up higher, uh, the road? Okay, so you have an engineering question. Oh, okay. 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 I have our engineering staff, if you could address that. Did you, is that all you had, sir? Did you oh, have yes, anything sir. else? I just want to make sure that uh, who's on one accord. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And what we'll do is we just sent out a preliminary design so it doesn't have the exact access, but we will never close down your access or anything. We'll only work to improve it, and we'll okay. work with individual property owners okay. uh, to talk about it. Um, as far as if the road's going to be higher or not, we have to get our survey crew out okay. there but we'll do a full drainage drainage analysis and everything okay. um, right. before we do any designs. Yeah, see how far I want, uh, see how far you're coming onto my property. Yeah, okay. absolutely. All of that will be discussed and we, we host public meetings whenever we do our designs as we go along. So okay. everybody will be kept up to date and, and, on that design as it goes forward. And sir, if you can leave your contact information with the clerk, we'll make sure staff reaches out to you when they're getting to that point. Okay. Okay, thank you. all right, thank you. Anyone else to speak to Aberdeen Road? All right, I'll close the hearing, bring it back to the council. Um, any questions, anything from council? Motion to uh, move to approve the sidewalk petition? Second. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, aye. motion carries. All right. You, you handle the sidewalk thing, so I'm letting the right. vote settle down. <laughs> Our last sidewalk one is street and sidewalk petition, Lake Boone Trail. This duplicates some of the content, so I'm going to fly through this a little bit. To clarify um, one thing, there is in our city code the ability to assess for sidewalks, but city council, and I believe it was 2011, decided that they did not want to assess for sidewalks. Um, so the $32 a linear foot is just for the curb and gutter in the street. There, if we still assess for sidewalk, there would be an additional assessment for the sidewalk on both this project and the previous one. And again, this is a street improvement petition for a section of Lake Boone Trail, officially known as Lake Boone Trail Extension because of how it was subdivided and created. Um, it connects to the um, to Glenwood or very close to Glenwood Avenue. It's in Council District E. It's about 650 linear feet and again, 27 foot wide um, curb to curb street with a five foot sidewalk and a three and a half foot set, setback. Both of those match some sections of the street are already improved to those standards. The estimated cost for this is about $285,000 and for $32 a linear foot of assessments, there'd be about 10,000 or I'm sorry, $11,000 of assessments for this. In the, the context of the neighborhood, this is, um, basically right next to Glenwood Avenue, if you know where the Harris Teeter is at that shopping center at Oberon Road, this would be contiguous with sidewalks that go to that and then also head down Lake Boone Trail in the other direction. And you can see on this map how some sections of it are in that orange color for new and some of them are blue because they're already in existence. Um, this one has seven properties that were petitioned. These are only the properties that did not have curb and gutter and therefore would be assessed. Some other people on the street um, were not a part of the petition because they have those improvements in front of their street. And of those seven, 100% of them, all seven for 100% of the linear footage um, are in support. Um, just schematically what that looks like, it is adding curb and gutter to the north side of the street where it's missing, adding curb and gutter and sidewalk to the south side of the street where it's missing, and it would tie to sidewalk on both sides of that. And I can answer questions. Any questions, council? All right, we'll open the floor, we'll open the public hearing for Lake Boone Trail Street and Sidewalk Improvement. Is there anyone here to speak on behalf of this one? Is there anyone here to speak on behalf of Lake Boone Trail Street and Sidewalk? Is there anyone here to speak? All right, seeing none, we'll close the hearing and bring it back to council. Uh Mayor Pro Tem, I, uh, I move to um, support the recommended, uh, no, sorry, where, yeah, support the recommended action. All right, it's been moved, take here a second? Yeah. Y'all, yeah. yeah. all right, Councilman Bob, for me. Um, it's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed have the same right. 
motion carries. All right. We now have petition annexation, South Hall Road. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Christopher Golden with City Planning. I'll just go ahead and uh, pull this up here. And the mouse is not cooperating, sorry. There we go. It's a little, sorry, it's a little touchy tonight. All right, there we go. So um, just very quickly, I wanted to uh, go ahead and apologize with the problems with the mouse. Uh, I just wanted to briefly touch upon a uh, brief introduction to annexation public hearing process. Uh, this will be old hat to uh, Mayor Baldwin and some of the senior members of the council, but uh, this is for the benefit of the new members of council, the newly minted members. Um, a little bit about annexation, very brief in one slide. Uh, petition annexation is a requirement for those uh, outside of city limits that want to either connect to utility, city utilities, uh, one utility or both utilities, or subdivise lands for the purpose of development. Um, so there are different types of annexations that you might have, deferrals, um, still go before council. That's when someone wants to hook up to one utility available. Sometimes they might hook up to both. Um, historically, the presentations that have been given by planning staff, uh, they've been on a case-by-case -case basis. And that's uh, most, a lot of annexations are fairly cut and dry for, uh, there, we do provide presentations. Uh, Council will generally open, the mayor will open a public hearing, ask if anyone wants to speak or not speak, uh, and then we are ready with a presentation. Uh, there, in, historically, there haven't been many questions uh, for annexations that aren't out of the ordinary, but often there might be some specific characteristics about an annexation where uh, members of the council and the mayor might have some questions. We're more than uh, happy to uh, assist them with that. There'll always be presentation slides available for this purpose, and I'll uh, jump ahead and just show you what that is. Uh, and uh, one of the things I did want to mention, two things, is that uh, generally uh, when annexation, when an annexation goes through, uh, if it is not approved, that doesn't always mean that they can't hook up to utilities. Uh, we accept a position, we put it forward. If the utilities are readily available, uh, if a petition is not approved, uh, many cases uh, when the annexation is within the ETJ, uh, they can hook up, but they pay out of uh, city rates. Um, a in the petition annexation, uh, in the public hearing, it is not uncommon that the applicant isn't present. We do suggest and we urge them to be here. I think in many cases it's viewed as a uh, just an administrative process for many people and a condition for subdivision or utility. So we do ask for them to be here. They're not always here. So don't be surprised when that, uh, when that does take place. Uh, just very briefly and jumping ahead, when you get to South Hall, this is what a typical annexation petition slide looks like. Uh, the first page generally has characteristics about that individual property. It'll show you where that property is located. Uh, in this case, uh, it, it will also indicate sometimes the zoning and whether or not a subdivision plan has been approved. In the case of South Hall, it has. We'll also show you the site location. Uh, we'll show you the location of the utilities. Uh, if you have questions about that, we'll have that available. Uh, we'll also include the current zoning. Um, in this case, it's a split zoning, mixed use and uh, R10. Uh, we'll also show you topography and floodplain. If it was in a floodplain, you would see some bright colors here. Obviously, this then this property is not within a floodplain. Uh, and we'll also show you a street view, so you can see what it looks like now, and you can see some characteristics like people doing uh, a little bit of a roundabout there. <laughs> so. Uh, I can answer any questions that you have. If not, I'll step back and let you open the hearing on that, so. All right, um, so anyone here to, s I'll open the hearing. Um, is there anyone here to speak on this annexation? Is there anyone here to speak on South Hall annexation? Is there anyone here to speak on South Hall annexation? I will close the hearing and bring it back. Um, just one thing I do wanna br bring up, if you can go back to the map where you had the water lines. Absolutely. Um, water and sewer. Yes. Okay, so the yellow lines are just some right sewer? Uh, correct, the yellow or green uh, line, okay. greenish lines are sewer and the blue lines would be water. In this case for okay. South Hall, you have both going directly to the site. 
Okay. Any questions from any counselors? Um, I've been by this area. I know it well. It's actually right on the border between C and B. Um, but I move for approval of this annexation. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those nays have the same right. Motion carries. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We have one more petition of annexation. Ponderosa Service Road. Yeah. So this is a little bit special because it's not in the corporate limits. My name is Bynum Walter. I work in the planning department, and I don't usually speak with you about annexation. Mostly, I, right. when you see me, it means rezoning. Uh, but we're going to talk about uh, this Ponderosa case tonight in, a, in two contexts. One, annexation, and two, rezoning. And we'll, you'll want to consider them together. If you want to rezone, you have to annex. If you don't want to rezone, you probably don't want to annex. So this is located on the west, uh, west side of Capitol Boulevard. Uh, I believe this is Mr. Cox's district, uh, correct? Right? Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, so there's a very long, narrow parcel on the west side of uh, Capitol Boulevard. There's a view of the site from the, so Ponderosa Service Road runs parallel to Capitol Boulevard, so there's a view of the site. Um, you can see uh, where water and sewer, so there's water at the front of the property, it looks like, uh, but, and uh, it looks like sewer comes in uh, towards the back end, uh, just south of that pond that's labeled with a big green B on it. Uh, and there is, we talked about topography earlier, there are those bright colors that Christopher mentioned. So there's uh, the floodway and the floodplain shown in blue and purple. And the current zoning here, there's, uh, this is currently uh, in unincorporated Wake County. It's adjacent to our ETJ, so it's eligible for annexation. And it has a combined zoning of highway district, which allows some uh, retail and commercial use, and then also R30, which requires about 30,000 square feet per unit. So pretty close to three quarters of an acre per unit for development. And uh, so my advice. We're going to go ahead, yeah. go right on to right. number seven is rezoning. Yeah. So uh, what I would suggest is after I talk about both pieces, you hold the two separate hearings. Right. Uh, so this is a request to rezone the same 19 acres uh, from R30 and Highway District to apply Raleigh City zoning. That's a residential 10 district, which allows up to 10 <coughs> units per acre. There's some conditions applied. And then the Urban Watershed Protection Overlay District is also proposed to be applied. There's a Watershed, over, uh, watershed Protection Overlay District in the county zoning present already. So we're uh, just bringing forward uh, comparable city regulations uh, to represent those. It is, this is actually consistent with the future land use map. The council back in October adopted a comprehensive plan amendment to make a change here. Uh, the Planning Commission does recommend approval of the rezoning in question tonight. And uh, that there's that annexation question that I mentioned earlier. So here's a good aerial view of the site. You can see there are a couple of houses up near the front and then a lot of trees. Again, that view of the site. Uh, so a couple of conditions here. Uh, they've uh, made some limits on outdoor lighting. They've prohibited some uses. And then they've also exempted themselves from the block perimeter standard which if, uh, for those of you who aren't super familiar with Raleigh regulation, uh, development regulation does require you to satisfy some block perimeter standards to improve connectivity of the grid, the network of the, of the streets in the city. And so they're saying they're not going to do that. And if you think about the disposition of the site, you might understand uh, why they feel like they can't accomplish that, just given the geometry of the site. Uh, they have um, made some limits about, remember you saw the floodway and the floodplain, so they're making some limits on the west end of the site in that area about development there. Um, and uh, also making some commitments about not disturbing the wetlands back there. So the change here is really a pretty significant increase in entitlement for residential units. Um, and then they're uh, eliminating all potential for commercial or, or retail use here in favor of that residential entitlement. So that's the, the trade-off they're asking for for the additional uh, residential. The urban form uh, designation here is a parkway corridor. The urban form map gives us, uh, gives us guidance in considering rezonings. 
about um, how development on a property should address the street or how tall it should be, uh, just general ideas about urban design. And so the parkway corridor designation basically is saying uh, the frontage should be green, should be buffered to maintain that uh, green Raleigh feel of so many of our suburban corridors. It, it should be pointed out that just to the left of, um, I guess that would be to the west of Capitol Boulevard, there is the Ponderosa service road. So there is a road parallel to Capitol Boulevard. So there's a short stretch of land between the Ponderosa service road and Capitol Boulevard. It's that little sliver of green there. That's exactly right. The property has a Ponderosa service road address. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so if approved, uh, if you decide to take action on the annexation, you are then obligated to apply city zoning. And so if you decide to move forward that with that annexation, the rezoning at requested by the applicant is this residential 10 with a parkway frontage, the conditions, and the over, overlay district. Um, this is no, not true. Uh, the, there are a number of consistent policies here. You can read more detail in your packet in the backup if you would like, or I can talk with you about that. Uh, and then there are a couple of inconsistent policies, which are now, I believe, the uh, all of them are consistent because of that amendment that was approved back in October. Uh, the Planning Commission uh, recommends approval, and then the North CAC had a split vote in favor. Okay. So all of the inconsistent C's are now consistent. Yes, sir. They've been okay. resolved by that amendment that was approved by the council back in October. Yeah. Can I answer questions for you before you open the public hearing for either the annexation or the rezoning? Yes. I know I said a lot. Process. And I just like launched into a foreign language for some of you, so. <laughs> just Forgive a process me. question. I mean, do we decide the annexation first before the zoning, or do we do the zoning first and then the annexation? Um, so to apply zoning, you have to annex. And if you annex, you must rezone. Uh, so <laughs> chicken or egg? I feel All like right. you, I guess I would say some discussion at the table might be appropriate before any action. Uh, uh, but the first vote does need to be the annexation vote, okay. just for procedural process. But you can talk about them together. That's Two right. votes, you must, annexation first. You right. must annex. could annex, but not apply the requested zone. In theory, yes, you could. Okay. Okay, so what we'll do is we will open the hearing for both first and then bring it back. Um, I did have one question for staff. It has to do with the the flood plan and floodway as far as their buffer in the code. How what's what are the requirements there as far as? So they have limited themselves specifically uh, to no improvements except what's required for. Um, by code for public improvements. So they're saying they're not gonna build back there unless there's a, some kind of easement or something like that that we require of them. And then they're also saying in that area that it would remain undisturbed from added fill, except for the installation of any required public improvement. Okay. So if they're having to um, operate sewer line back there, they may have to make some grading adjustments for that reason, right. but they're limiting themselves. But otherwise they're limiting any construction within mm -hmm. Um, yeah. a thousand feet okay. yeah and similarly disturbance of the wetlands perfect and I know uh, that stormwater staff is here tonight if you have more detailed questions than that okay all right so at this time what we'll do first is open the public hearing for the rezoning is there anyone here to speak on behalf for the project eight minutes per side Good evening. My name is David Brown. I'm a landscape architect and planner, Withers Ravenel, 137 South Wilmington Street here in Raleigh. I'm here tonight with our client, KB Home. Uh, Bynum has done an excellent job uh, detailing the specifics of this case. I mostly want to just make myself available if you have any questions tonight. Um, okay. How many units are you all looking to? It's, it's approximately 90. Um, it's a little bit of a it's, it hasn't been engineered yet, okay. but that's a, that's a schematic yield. I, I do want to point out a couple of items. Uh, immediately to the north of the site is a DHIC community. I had the privilege of working with them on that project in 2006. It's, it's a great night in Raleigh when the market rate um, developer is applying to build next to the affordable housing community. I think it just says a lot about how far we've come in Raleigh. Um, and that is also where we're getting our sewer extension. 
uh, is through a developed property to the north. And right now, we don't anticipate having to take the sewer through the uh, sensitive lands uh, along Richland Creek, including the wetlands. I just make myself available. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else here to speak in favor of this project? Okay. Anyone here to speak against the project? My name is Joan Levy. I live at 10 Ponderosa Park Drive, Wake Forest, North Carolina. There's about 50 families that live in that area. I am only one of three property owners that live there. And we couldn't even speak at the CAC because the Northern CAC, um, only people there could speak and we are in unincorporated Wake County and we're not allowed to vote. And the people who voted against were all the two people who actually had land or property that affected it. But the, none of the 50 of us could have voted. None of those households could have voted against it. So <clears throat> one of the big problems is the traffic there. I sent an email to the city clerk that you should have detailing all the problems that happen. And I've spoken to the consultant for the transportation for who's they're doing the highway, limited access highway on Capitol Boulevard, which will make the only exit out of that area through Forest Pines or Common Oaks. And anyone who's been at Forest Pines and Falls of the Noose or Falls of the Noose and Capitol Boulevard between 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock, you can see gridlock that looks like my hometown of New York City. You can't get out adding another 180 cars, perhaps, or 150 cars to that. And the transportation person, the consultant to the transportation, talked about how that they weren't sure how the traffic flow was going to be going. But those little exits off of Ponderosa Service Road will be closed to get onto Capitol Boulevard. So the only way in and out of my little subdivision that goes back towards the trailer park behind me is to go north around Common Oaks or the bigger street that's, little wider street that's up there before you get to the curve around. That's the only way out that leads to um, Falls of the Noose. So I'm opposed to that. And I'm also opposed to where no representation, you know? We had no say. Nobody, we couldn't do anything. So. And I'm open to questions, and I want to thank you all. You earn every penny if you earn any money up there. <laughs> so I'm open to any questions you have. Oh, I do have one, ma'am. Um, so do you live in the mobile home park? No, I do not. You live in that little circle of homes? I live in that. There's a pond. Mm -hmm. I, I can point to it right here, but you can't see it up there. So as you come, right when you come in that Ponderosa, See the little houses? Mm -hmm. There's, right. a, a, There's little a little circle of little, little houses. Little circle of houses yeah. There's a little circle of little houses. And I live behind them on eight and a half acres. Okay. So I live, okay. I live there and I own the property and I live there. At the very corner of those little houses, yes, that's my, if you, yes, that's my house. That, that round circle there, that dark circle behind, that's my pond. Yeah, that's my pond. And those, all those little trees I planted, so. Um, and there is no way that the people who live in the trailer park, who work in that Common Oaks shopping center, we have to walk, they have to walk out onto the road, onto Ponderosa Service Road, to get up to and go into Common Oaks Drive and the, and the um, shopping center. And many of those people work in that area. There's a Spanish restaurant that they work in. They work at Harris Teeter. So they have to walk along Ponderosa Service Road to get to Common Oaks. Okay. So and, and there's a lot of traffic. There's so your concern is traffic. the traffic on Common Oaks? It, the traffic is okay. once they close off those little service roads that we can now get to, off of Ponderosa Service Road, directly out to Capitol. They're going to close those. Everybody, including the people who are going to be in those new homes, we're all going to have to feed north onto Common Oaks Drive. And there's two mm -hmm. ways off of Common Oaks Drive to go all the way around the circle or straight ahead there. Where the Oaks is, 
That's a road that's called Forest Pines. So Forest Pines leads to Falls of the Noose, as does Common Oaks Drive. So question. We're all going to be fu funneled out that way only. So regardless if this is built, approved it or not, you're still going to be funneled out that way, correct? Once they start, once they start making that the highway, we're all going to be funneled out that way, yes. Okay. They're going to close us off there. Okay. Is it possible for us to hear from someone from traffic, transportation? transportation. Thank you. Is anyone here to talk to us about that? Fantastic. Thank you. The um, the is, is the project that was mentioned is is a NCDOT project, and NCDOT has put a stoppage to some of the work they've been doing in planning projects. So none of this information is new, and it is not certain because those decisions haven't been made. But but the but the woman was correct that this is a, I forgot we can't touch i'm so used to being able to draw on this um, <laughs> common oaks turns into ponderosa service and it serves the quarry and has some points of connection to capitol boulevard those would be severed if that project is complete ncdot is most likely to extend ponderosa service as a new street over the railroad tracks and connect it to an interchange at burlington mill and that's something both the town of wake forest and the city of raleigh will be advocating for it's not something that we can promise the city staff. It's not our decision, it's not our project. Um, but the expectation is that we don't want the quarry traffic all coming up into right, right. the Common Oaks right. area. And it may, and just from a redundancy standpoint, having only one point of access is not a, not a good idea. So the project has an interchange north of here, it has an interchange south of here, and extending Ponderosa service tank to both interchanges is what we believe the strategy and CDOT will be, and it's certainly the strategy the city wants and CDOT to take. Right, because I'm, I'm fully aware of the quarry and the trucks, and it just, it, it, it surprised me to hear that both of those exits would be closed off because then you close off the quarry. Right. What so. does the timeline look like for NCDOT to make that decision and or implement it once a decision has been made? I don't know that we can say. They've put a stoppage to the planning activities that are there. Um, my recollection of the timeline was that they were hoping to start the, doing a design build process, start the design build process, I think late next year right. under their original timeline. Um, that's probably slipped some, but I, I don't know exactly. I, I want to say it's probably been slipped at, at least good two years. five years. Yeah, five, yeah. I, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, it's something we could we could dig into a little bit and get back to you if it's important. I don't have that information. Okay, so there here. won't be any time. It obviously won't be any time soon. Right. Because then you're talking about design of a billion-dollar well, project that... The, the way that this would be planned is that the suite of improvements would be studied as a preferred alternative under the environmental document that they're required to do, and then they would have kind of the, the maximum impact, and then their design build teams would build within that framework. Um, so we would know by that point what the points of connection and what the improvements would be, um, but not necessarily the exact design details. Okay, okay. And, and, and on the east side of this site, uh, where it meets Ponderosa Service Road, uh, the developer would be providing a sidewalk on that little sliver right there. Can you see the pointer at all? On yeah, there? yeah, okay. we can. Mm -hmm. So any streets they build within the development would have sidewalks on both sides, as I stated earlier, as and they would be required to do frontage improvements along their very narrow frontage of, mm -hmm. of Ponderosa service. Now, given the way that that subdivision might be reviewed by development services, it may not be known what NCDOT was going to do to be able to tie them correctly, mm -hmm. and they may pay a fee in lieu and, and let the NCDOT project do that. Okay. Um, but one way or another, there will be a sidewalk there as long as NCDOT continues with their project or the city um, does their normal subdivision review there. I guess the thing that I was that's new information to me tonight uh, that is a little concerning is that there are people, there is a mobile home court there, and, and I just don't know how many people uh, living there come up and walk along Ponderosa Service Road to get to the shopping plaza, either to work or to shop or to go to the movie. Um, and uh, so I didn't know if, uh, if they can't build us, if we don't require them to build a sidewalk, would it be possible to build any kind of right-of-way there that would allow some safety in terms of for pedestrians? 
One thing I would add is there is a plan street on the street plan, which is one of the maps in our comprehensive plan that goes north south through this property. So the, the block perimeter exemption they gave ref, was in reference to the floodplain in that direction. They are still required to build a north south street stubbing okay. to both the north and the south. And if the property to the north were to also be developed, it would have to reciprocate that connection huh. and you would shortcut the, the curve. And as long as there was some way to get to the stub on the south, to, from the mobile home park, which would require them to, and the mobile home park to reciprocate it, then then there could be a north-south path that wouldn't in, really involve Ponderosa service. But that's both on development north and south of, of this site. Right, right. Okay. All right. Is there anyone else here to speak against this project? And this is for market rate housing and not affordable housing? Is that correct? This, that's, this, market that, rate? this is for. And, and if, we're, if we're rezoning, if we're rezoning something to make market rate housing, wouldn't, shouldn't we wait until we get our affordable deficit taken care of before we start building? So, so I'm going to let the stuff? city attorney address how, we, how affordable housing impacts zoning. There hasn't been any condition, but there's no reason you shouldn't go forward with this case at this time. I mean, right. We, we cannot require the developer to offer an affordable housing condition. It, right. it hasn't been offered, so you right. would decide it on its merits with other things and and go forward. There's There should be no connection between holding up any kind of case right now and your future affordable housing policy. All right. Thank you. Um, if there's no one else here to speak against it, I will close. Did you have a, you want to give some information? I think I had a little bit of time remaining. I just wanted to make a couple of quick comments. Uh, the effective density on this track um, is, is, would be considered low density. It would be under five units to the acre. Um, the area plan prior to our comp plan amendment talked about um, office and technology and research. So in my opinion, of course, it's also highway district, county zoning not likely to be developed that way. I think we're reducing the intensity here greatly. And if the concern is traffic, I think this is a great step forward. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. I know the Since lady you have some time left. Yeah, I go know ahead. the lady who spoke for Mr. Belk said that it was in compliance to both the plan and the map. I have an email, I can't find it right now. But my last email with Mr. Belk this past week was that one of those two is not in compliance and I sent that in my email to the city clerk as of from Mr. So you have that in there, which of those two, whether it's the plan or the map. But so, Mr. Belk told me it was not. I have an email back okay. and forth from him. Okay, thank you. Um, we're closing the hearing, bringing it back to council. Um, can you address I, that? Yeah, I just wanted to confirm that it is consistent overall with the plan, the comprehensive plan, and it is also consistent with the future land use map. So in October, uh, the applicant uh, was working three transactions at once on the, for this property, a comprehensive plan amendment, a rezoning request, and an annexation request. And the comprehensive plan amendment was approved back in October. Okay. It is consistent with the future land use map. All right. Any other questions from council? No. All right. Um, now, I have to do a public hearing for the annexation. So I now open the hearing for the annexation. Is there anyone here to speak for annexation? Is there anyone here to speak against annexation? Okay. I will close the hearing um, on the annexation as well. So. It's back to council um, if we, so thoughts? Well, what I would like to do is I, I think, um, and I appreciate the concerns about the traffic, but uh, I really think this is uh, probably a very good project. And uh, so I don't know that we need a consistency statement for annexation. No consistency statement. You would make the motion, vote on annexation, and then move to your next motion, which would include the consistency statement. Right. So I'll make a motion uh, to approve the annexation of this property for Second. properties. Second. It's been moved and properly second to approve annexation. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed have the same right. Motion carries. Now, with regards to the rezoning request, I move to adopt the proposed consistency statement dated December 3rd, 2019, contained in, contained in the agenda materials, and to approve the zoning amendment. Second. It's been moved and properly second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed have the same right. 
Motion carries. All right. Thank you. We will now move to Z3218. So this is another somewhat special situation. Z32 is a request for a plan development district, which is a special kind of custom district. So the applicant is requesting to rezone a little bit over nine acres from districts that allow a three-story height limit and residential or industrial mixed use to this plan development district. And their uh, definition-based new zoning district uh, as part of the request would be industrial mixed use with a 20-story height limit. The Southwest CAC recommends approval and the Planning Commission does not. You can see this is a triangle of land located south of downtown. You can see the residential mixed use area indicated in orange and you can see there's a fair amount of residential mixed use to the north of the site here. So we're on the west side of Dawson, south of Martin Luther King, uh, sorry, south of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Western Boulevard. Um, and then the pinkish purple area is that industrial mixed use zoning that's in place now. So they're not changing really the um, definition of the base district there, but they are changing the height significantly. And across McDowell, Dawson, you can see a large area zoned R10, residential 10, that's the Mount Hope Cemetery. And to the, the blue area to the northwest of this is Dorothea Dix Park, just to help with um, orientation and then just north of the park you can see the Boylan Heights Historic District. So an aerial view of the site, uh, there are a couple of buildings here but largely undeveloped at this point. Uh, a couple of street views of the site, so this is on the west side looking from uh, Western Boulevard, uh, Wheels for Hope used to be located here and has since vacated. And so looking south along South Saunders and then another view looking north along South Saunders. And then on the east side along the Dawson McDowell frontage views of the site. So you can see there's a grade change between the right of way and the property in that uh, third view in the upper left hand corner. So just a quick introduction about a plan development district. Uh, it allows the applicant basically to write custom standards that modify the UDO development stamp, the unified development standards that regulate physical development in the city. This is the one time in zoning world where you can make things less restrictive than what's required by code. Uh, they, the modifications in general need to be based on design principles and the application also includes a master plan that shows layout, phasing, infrastructure, natural areas and open space and I'll show you some of those images as we go along. And there's also pretty extensive coordinated staff review to ensure that what's adopted, if it is adopted, can be enforced uh, at the time of site plan that we can actually regulate it. So uh, the <coughs> master plan here is bringing forward uh, what they're calling pods. There are four of them. So uh, there's pod A kind of runs through the heart of the site and includes the old Wheels for Hope location. Pod B includes most of the South Saunders frontage. Pod C is frontage on Dawson McDowell, and Pod D is the um, mostly riparian area along the Greenway, immediately adjacent to the existing Gateway Parks uh, <coughs> development. And they have um, specified the maximum entitlement for each of those areas, and then specified a site entitlement overall. The site entitlement overall is less than the cumulative entitlement requested in each pod, so they have uh, created a lot of flexibility for themselves in terms of where the entitlement lands on the site. And in uh, pods A, B, and C, the maximum height is 20 stories, and on pod D, which is the uh, largely open space and greenway area, the maximum height there is 15 feet. The only structure they're uh, contemplating or allowing there is like a gazebo type outdoor shelter uh, uh, type program. Uh, and then significant office in, or industrial entitlement across all the uh, development pods. Pretty significant retail entitlement. If you think of a grocery store, it's about 50,000 square feet. So that's, you know, more than three grocery stores, about 500 residential units uh, per pod. The lodging units are, are not equitable across the um, pods, but are pretty significant in each one. 
So the um, <coughs> residential density here allowed would go up from about 24 units an acre to a little bit over 100 units. The maximum total number of units allowed is uh, just under 1,000, and they're adjusting the required setbacks. The industrial mixed-use base district has a, a base requirement of a five-foot required setback, and as they're part of their modification, they're removing that uh, five-foot re requirement uh, to mimic more like the downtown uh, district, a more urban district. Um, so just a, a pretty significant entitlement increase across the board that they're asking for here. Uh, they have prohibited a handful of uses, uh, generally things that we would consider uh, more high impact or uh, intrusive, but the uh, overall spectrum of uses that they're allowing, you know, this is a list of like 10, is quite uh, robust. The open space plan, so uh, this is oriented a little bit differently than the image I showed you before. So South Sonner Street is on the top here now. And so the Greenway and Gateway Apartments are on the bottom right part of the site. So they have um, provided open space that's approximately 18% uh, of the site. That includes lands that, not, that is not buildable anyway uh, and that's inside the riparian buffer. But it is um, more than the 10% that would be normally required. And then they've also specified the tree conservation area that would be located along Dawson Street. Uh, and there's a code required greenway easement that would run parallel to the creek there on the uh, project site side of the creek. Uh, they've made modifications to uh, both the general and mixed use building type. So the code identifies very broad building type categories and we regulate development based on the building type. So they've made a handful of uh, amendments here related to how they provide the amenity, amenity area by those pods A, B, C, and D rather than by building. And then uh, they've adjusted their building setback and their structured parking setback. And then also some ground level transparency requirements have been waived along Dawson Street. And then for just the mixed, bu uh, mixed use building type, they have reduced the ground level transparency uh, kind of internal to the site. So Dawson's already been eliminated. So they're keeping a particular standard for Saunders, but the required the standard standard for Saunders and reducing the interior. Uh, and then they've also uh, reduced their parking requirements. Really, they mimic uh, how we would treat urban frontage, uh, which addresses how projects meet the street uh, and also for particular uses. So reducing the parking that would be required overall. They've also adjusted um, the street dimensions for the internal streets. So they're specifying a narrower right-of-way width and also a narrower uh, standard sidewalk and uh, tree planting area for uh, the area. Uh, the streets are a little bit wider, closer to the Saunders Street right-of-way. So basically they're pro uh, proposing an L-shaped interior street here and the um, Section closest to the street would include a turn lane, closest to Saunders would include a turn lane, and then the more interior section uh, would not. And again, the uh, adjustments to the uh, public right of way width, uh, particularly the travel width, and then also the um, sidewalk and uh, tree planting area, similarly for those internal streets. And so I've, I've included the specific uh, measurements here in case you're interested in that. Uh, we, uh, the applicant is required to uh, complete traffic analysis as part of the plan development request. Uh, a handful of intersections uh, were found that they would likely operate below the city's adopted standards for service uh, if the project were completed at the full entitlement that they've allowed themselves, specifically uh, South Saunders at West South, South Dawson at West South, and MLK at uh, the South One Wilmington Salisbury uh, intersection. Uh, there also was uh, likely uh, anticipated queuing internal to the site, so the turn lanes that they're providing in that wider width section of the internal streets does not include a particularly deep stacking area, and so an expectation that traffic would likely back up internal to the site. And the only uh, access that they're uh, allowing themselves at this point is from South Saunders. Uh, so uh, just a, some thoughts there about solutions if you wanted to address that. 
Um, they would be required to make some improvements along South Saunders, some planting um, and some realignment to realize some street plan uh, ideas that are adopted for the South Saunders Lake Wheeler intersection. So a change to the geometry there so that South Saunders meets Lake Wheeler at more of a T so that the um, uh, default movement along Lake Wheeler would be uh, Saunders to Lake Wheeler rather than Saunders to Saunders. Uh, and then they have also provided a pedestrian circulation plan that largely mimics the internal street plan but also connects the internal streets to the uh, Greenway easement and there's a a uh, bridge that provides connectivity to the Greenway uh, network and also a promenade along the Greenway easement. Uh, they have required pedestrian facing entrances along South Saunders. Ground floor active use is required along South Saunders. And there's that uh, typical 50% ground floor transparency in the same area. They've said that at least 5% of the units will be no larger than 550 square feet. So they're trying to get at that micro unit, a more affordable unit and they have um, required at least 30 feet separation between buildings within the same pod that are, have towers greater than seven stories. And then in, within each uh, pod, they're requiring at least two stories height difference between the tallest and the shortest building. So if they build a two story building, they have to at least build a four story building. If they build a 20 story building, they have to at least build an 18 story building, for example. Uh, this is the massing model that they were required to include with their petition. So the view on the left is looking from Western Boulevard south along South Saunders. And the um, <coughs> view on the right is looking from Western Boulevard more along the Dawson McDowell. And you can see uh, gateway apartments in the foreground of both. Uh, this is consistent with the uh, future land use map, which is uh, regional mixed use and public parks and open space. Uh, the urban form map that was adopted at the time of this project being submitted uh, for staff review up through the day that it was scheduled for this public hearing uh, indicated that there was transit emphasis corridor along McDowell and there was really no other significant urban form designation. The day we scheduled this for a uh, public hearing, we adopted a new urban form map uh, which designates this site as now core transit and also transit oriented development district, recognizing the likely implementation of BRT uh, in this area. And I, I would say that uh, you might have a different feeling about some of the policies that have been called inconsistent as a result of the change in the urban form map. Um, but given that that happened the day you set the hearing it, it really made more sense for us to carry forward our analysis based on the policy that had been in place at the time. So overall, considered inconsistent with the comprehensive plan. The urban format was always consistent, but I think how you interpret some of the other policies you might find to be a different, you might feel differently based on the new map. Mm -hmm. um, so a handful of consistent policies, a handful of inconsistent policies. Uh, the Planning Commission recommends denial. They were largely concerned about in inconsistency with the plan and also the lack of design specificity. So I will just say the amount of entitlement that they are allowing themselves is significant. They have not made a commitment about anything that they absolutely will build, right? So they've allowed themselves a lot but not provided a lot of specific specificity about what they actually will build. Um, and then the Southwest CSC recommends approval. Uh, that was a lot. What can I? What kind of questions can I answer for you before you open the hearing? Any questions? Uh, one question I have is, based on the changes of policies, mm -hmm. are any inconsistent statements previously now consistent? Uh, I was looking at that uh, in preparing for this, and. Um, I don't, I don't feel strongly about that. Okay. I, th I think uh, reasonable people could disagree. Okay. That's the only questions I have so far. Basically, what's inconsistent prior is still inconsistent is for what I'm gathering mm -hmm. um, from staff's analysis. That, that answer is somewhat concerning to me. I mean, if you were looking at it, 
what is your analysis? Uh, so the inconsistent policy is zoning and infrastructure impacts. I don't think that's changed by the urban form map. The traffic concerns are still there. Uh, reinforcing the urban Even though path. it's on a BRT. Even it, though it's on a BRT. Yeah, the projections for um, what is going to happen to the traffic there, the level of service at those three intersections is still there. The stacking internal to the site is still there, regardless of how we change the policy. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think that that contributes to inconsistency on the managing commercial commercial development impacts, um, the multimodal grids uh, issue, the level of service issue. Um, those ones I think I think are hard to shift just with a policy change. Uh, you might argue that reinforcing the urban pattern, architectural features, creating att attractive facades and city gateways, you might ar make an argument that uh, changing policy there might change consistency. But I think some of those service concerns are, are hard to shift with just a policy change. Okay. And there were no things, this is a PD and I know it's not conditioned, but is That's there right. anything they could have put in to address the traffic concerns? Sure, there, I think there are things they could do. They could have, um, they could increase the stacking internal to the site. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's some uh, connections to Dawson or McDowell that they could pursue that they haven't. That's probably not gonna be a tr uh, uh, automobile connection, but it might be a, um, pedestrian connection that might allow service from the McDowell Dawson corridor. One of the things that we've done previously is that we have tied site plan approval to um, level of service. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we might approve as a rezoning, say up to 40 stories, but when they would do their traffic analysis at site plan review, it might be that if we've degraded the level of service below an E, for example, um, then uh, that would trigger a decrease in height. That they could also permitted. do that at the time of rezoning to lower the uh, maximum height or the overall entitlement that they're requesting. You know, right. They could limit either the amount of square footage or the building height right. to address that. So, so maybe one of the things that, that we might be able to do is um, consider referring this perhaps to growth of natural resources for further discussion to explore some of these possibilities. Um, I just, thank you. I know that the city has not done many PDs, um, so bless you and the rest of the staff who've worked hard to do, um, get this to this point. Um, as the district rep for this project, I'm quite it's, excited. We need to go to public here. Yeah, you wanna hear from the public, right? Yeah, we gotta do yeah. public here. Ooh, first. I didn't say that. Never mind. we're okay. gonna go to public here. All right. <laughs> Mr. Branch, thank you for taking over for me um, during my coughing spasm. Um, I appreciate that. And um, also, you have a lot of experience. I think you <laughs> did better than me, so um, appreciate that as well. Okay. Um, we are going to open up this hearing. Um, we will start with eight minutes um, for the, um, I see Michael Birch here, um, and we'll start with Michael. I guess we won't start with Michael. You get me. That's okay. Corey Mason, 1615 Ambleside Drive, Raleigh 27605. Um, I know it's been a long day for you guys, so we're going to try to keep this as brief as possible. Um, I saw you guys here at 1, and you're still here. So um, Michael's going to address some of those concerns. Um, that staff has more specifically. Um, I'm gonna start off the presentation. Um, a lot of you guys have seen this before, so this is more of a reminder and sort of a, a refresher um, as we've sort of been working with staff um, and many people from the public for over two years on this project. So yes, it's a PD, it's very difficult to understand, it's lots of information, um, and so picture's worth a thousand words, and so you know, we have developed our pictures since those early massing models. And so what we're going to show you reflects a lot of those conversations that we've had both with staff that's represented legally in the PD, as well as community members um, in the public. And so um, 
out of all of those conversations, four key sort of components of this project. Uh, I, I guess that you could call them values of the project emerge. One, this is a gateway project. It's a really, really iconic um, sort of site for our city. And so we need to do the right thing with it. And so what we put here really matters. Um, kind of in that same vein, um, what we heard was we need better architecture in this city and that that will result in better places. Um, and I know that Michael or the clerk had a handout for you guys. Some of what's highlighted in that handout is the codification of those, those design elements. Um, and so they, they're highlighted in there. Um, we're not going to specifically talk about all the ones. Um, the other sort of highlight um, is the Greenway. As, as Bynum mentioned, it runs on both sides of the creek. Um, one's existing, one's proposed. You can see here uh, a view of the new kind of urbanized Greenway and here with the proposed access to the creek. Again, um, we think this is a great opportunity for the city. It would be a great public benefit to be the first place where you can eat and drink um, and have a good time with your friends on the Greenway and then march over to Dick's. Um, which brings me to the fourth kind of connection point. We've made a significant investment as a city um, in the largest park planning project in the country. Um, and so this would be the first project um, to kind of reinforce that investment, if you will. And um, with that, I'm gonna let Michael really kind of iron out and kind of talk through some of the key issues um, as well as you know the overall benefits of the project. Again, good evening. Uh, Michael Birch with Longleaf Law Partners. And um, before I touch on some of the specific questions that were raised um, during the staff review, uh, staff report, I'll just touch on public benefits. And as Corey was mentioning, the city has made uh, an incredible investment in this area uh, in terms of money, in terms of planning and effort, uh, in terms of actual kind of development. Uh, and all with the thought that that public investment would be followed by uh, private investment. And here we are with this project um, trying to kind of follow in the city's footsteps. And just wanted to, you know, y'all are aware, well aware of the city's um, role in Dix Park, taking a lead and kind of taking control of our transit future with uh, bus rapid transit that is proximate to the site, uh, Union Station uh, being within walking distance uh, of the site and of course the future uh, rust bus adjacent to Union Station. And I would say from a, a planning standpoint, the city a number of years ago uh, spent a significant effort on the Southern Gateway Plan and identified this as one of the four uh, kind of areas for redevelopment. And then of course the comprehensive plan update, which again kind of reinforced and solidified a lot of the policy changes since that time um, that highlighted this as uh, location for transit oriented development. Some of the specifics that we wanted to highlight uh, is the over 3,000 linear feet of new public sidewalks uh, along Saunders, internal to the site. Along, uh, in addition to that, over 850 feet of new greenway along Rocky Branch Creek, uh, also that pedestrian bridge, also pedestrian uh, connection across Lake Wheeler uh, to the greenway in Dix Park. Uh, bicycle parking spaces to accommodate alternate modes of transportation uh, and something that is very unusual for an urban site will have over three and a half acres of preserved natural environment um, which is over a third of the project area uh, this project also provides the opportunity for a number of partnerships uh, or partnership opportunities with the city going forward uh, one, given its uh, location across from Dix Park uh, and being one of the few kind of privately owned properties adjacent to the park, um, there's a great opportunity for shared parking uh, just to help serve the park. Uh, staff mentioned the uh, ability to partner on realignment, uh, the intersection of Lake Wheeler and Saunders. I would also note uh, the intersection of Hamill to the south. Um, and I would say, again, from a tax base standpoint, um, generating a significant increase over what's there that could be used to help support DICS going forward. 
And then from a city, city vision standpoint, we've touched on the area plan. We wanted to uh, address the city's vision and uh, kind of focus on uh, housing affordability with a commitment to micro units. Uh, and again, putting a project of this scale and size uh, proximate to the city's investments in transit. And I would note just that 17-1 CAC vote is reflective of the, uh, the two plus years that the applicant spent working with the community um, before even kind of moving forward with a project. Uh, and just as evidence of that, we just want to recognize um, that Merge Capital had already taken a step uh, and funded 50% of the project cost for the city's first uh, Greenway art project, which is at the uh, tunnel for the Rocky Branch Greenway. Um, so with that and in recognition of folks um, in the pub members of the public who came here to speak in support of the project, um, I would want to save some time for them, but hopefully have the opportunity to come up and address some of the comments uh, or questions as well. Okay, whoever's here to speak from the public, if you'd please step up, step up to the podium. Gail, could you put a hold on the time? Okay. There's, come on up, please. There's 47 seconds left. So is there anybody else here from the public who wants to speak on this? Okay. In support. Um, yeah. This is in support. Support. This is in, right, this is in support, right? Okay, if you will all step up there, there's 47 seconds left on the timer. So you're gonna to have to figure out how you're going to do this. And um, so name and address, please. Uh, Gerard Schofield, I live at 601 Sarver Court uh, in Fuller Heights. Sage, you're my guy. Um, just wanted to say that uh, I'm a pretty involved uh, community member. I've been to all these Dix Parks meetings, really excited about uh, what that's going to be and how this can be kind of a handshake um, deal to Dix Park. I think it's great. So uh, I have plenty more to say, but I'll be respectful of time. So Okay, whoever's next, pop up quick. Name Hello, I'm Brian Thomas, 1121 Harper Road, and I am pleased to be one of the 17 members of the Southwest CAC that voted in favor of this development. The one dissenting vote was cast because the applicant could not guarantee a rooftop restaurant to be built uh, in the development, which I think would be disingenuous of the applicant to guarantee at the time of rezoning. Thank you. Okay. All right. We have time for one more. You got four seconds. We're very much in favor for it. <laughs> uh, I'm Bob Edgerton, Southwest CAC Chair. We're in favor. <laughs> Thank you. That was the best. <laughs> that, that was a record. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now we will hear from um, anybody who is not in favor of the project. Anyone who would like to speak against it? Do come up and give your name and address. You're not the rooftop bar person, are you? I am not, and it's disingenuous to say I'm against it. I just want um, us to take into consideration with micro housing and micro units, what that actually entails. Uh, my husband and I had looked into doing this quite a few years ago, and um, it's not just putting up space for people to live, it's actually, they've got to share space. And um, so I, I just want us to be really, intentional with what we're building and the communities that we're putting together. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Anyone else like to speak on this case? Okay, we will close the hearing unless any counselors have any other questions. Okay, we will close the hearing. Um, Mr. Martin, you look like you're chomping at the bit a little bit. Me? Would you like no, to speak? I don't know. Thank okay. you, Mayor. Um, thank you. I just want to uh, thank everyone that stayed to speak um, in support uh, through th this long night, um, and that I, as the district, de am I allowed to? Yes. <laughs> district D rep. Um, I'm excited uh, to have this in front of us today, um, and I know that the community um, and the development team uh, and the CAC have worked hard in conjunction with one another, um, and that my uh, predecessor also supported this. Um, and so uh, I'm looking forward to the vote tonight. Okay. Um, w one thing I want to say about it, just the queuing in the streets, please be mindful 
um, of that when you go to site review um, and make sure that we do not, I know part of site review is you cannot degrade an intersection. So out of that, you will probably have to, you're, just because you're entitled to 20, doesn't mean you have to build it. Any other council members wish to speak? Okay, um, Councilor uh, Martin, do you have, you mentioned a vote, are you, sure. are you inclined to make thing. a motion? I would, um, okay. it's long so stick with me. Um, I move to adopt the proposed rezoning and to adopt the following consistency statement which I will read into the record and provide to the clerk. Uh, for the record. After considering the policies, maps, and other materials included as part of the comprehensive plan, the City Council determines that the proposed zoning amendment is inconsistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted plans. However, the request is consistent with a number of policies in the comprehensive plan, is reasonable and in the public interest, and should therefore be approved. The action taken is reasonable and in the public interest because the request is consistent with the future land use map, which designates this area as appropriate for regional mixed use. The request is consistent with the urban form map, which designates this area as appropriate for transit-oriented development. The request is consistent with a number of policies within the comprehensive plan, specifically LU 2.2 compact development, LU 8.1 housing variety, LU 11.4 rezoning development of industrial areas, UD 2.3 activating the public street, UD 3.9 parking lot design, AP SG 5 improving the greenway trail connections and AP SG 8 main street character of South Saunders, and finally the rezoning would facilitate redevelopment of an underutilized yet vital area adjacent to the future transit services and Dorothea Dix Park. I think that's the longest motion um, in the my time on council, but excellent. Okay, is there a second for second. that? Okay, um, thank you, Councilor Stewart. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion passes. <coughs> we now have Z719. This is a continuation of a hearing that was opened back in September, continued to uh, November 6th, and continued again to this evening. It also, this case also made an appearance in front of the Growth and Natural Resources Committee. It's a request to rezone about an acre and a half from a residential four uh, district that would allow about four residential units per acre to neighborhood mixed use, three-story height limit with a parking limited frontage and some conditions. The South CAC voted against this and the Planning Commission recommends approval. My understanding of the outstanding questions here were really about site access from uh, Rock Quarry Road and cross access to the commercial development adjacent to the north. Um, and talking with transportation staff, my understanding is that given the width of the site, uh, likely only one access point would be allowed and that there is a stub uh, paved on the commercial site to the north and a recorded cross access easement agreement and that transportation and site review would be likely to require that connection to be made. Um, the, I believe the applicant is here. She, uh, she uh, gamely, willingly offered a condition to guarantee the same and staff told her she couldn't do that. One, because the public hearing is still open. Two, because that uh, would duplicate the requirements of code. Um, and so I think she's here to answer any outstanding questions and transportation staff is here and I am well, as well if you have questions about this one. And I'm happy to provide a little bit of extra background on this for those of you who haven't been here uh, chewing on this one for a couple months if you need it. Okay, let's um, hear from the applicant. Let's hear from the applicant, please. Thank you. Name and address for the record. Yes. 
Um, Amanda Mann, I'm an attorney at the Morningstar Law Group, uh, 421 Fayetteville Street, Suite 520. Um, just so you note, I also have the uh, planner, uh, Joe Faulkner from CE Group, and Ryan L. Stevenson from Ramey Camp here as well, if you have other technical questions. Um, I want to be mindful of your time. I'm going to go quickly here. We've been working on this project since February. Um, we had our initial neighbor meeting. It was sparsely attended. Um, but we ended up getting support <coughs> there. We went before the CAC here for three different times in an attempt to sort of work with folks as much as we could. Um, we did ultimately end up with a negative vote. However, we, we did reduce the, the negative vote over time. Um, and we worked really hard to sort of meet with folks and try to get a sense of their concerns on traffic. Um, essentially, we did, after being here a couple of times, we went into the transportation committee uh, with Corey and Kay. Um, at that point, we discussed the access points, we discussed the family dollar parcel to the north, we extensively discussed traffic. Um, I worked with the city attorney's office. We were able to locate a recorded offer of um, cross access that had been recorded back in 2013. We worked with our site folks to make sure that that worked with their sort of hopeful desired site plan. Uh, that does work. We also went back and forth kind of looking at the internal site circulation and determined that one access point would be good as well. Um, everybody <laughs> sort of asked us to offer this as a condition. We did go through that whole process and then ultimately I guess that sparked some additional uh, internal conversations at the city and they told us that we couldn't do that but I just want to make it clear that we did investigate all of these things and we understand that that's probably going to be the limitation we think that that will effectively resolve hopefully the traffic concerns that folks had and that the the committee had and I'll stop for now if anybody has questions or okay is there anybody else here to speak in favor of this is there anybody here to speak against the project Okay, who, um, the district counselor here is uh, Mr. Yes. Branch. So we had a lot of conversation about traffic in this area. Um, and one of the major concerns was um, egress to the site. Um, they have, we did ask them to go back and try to address those concerns and they did the work. Um, they found the deed and everything and it comes out that site plan would have fixed it. Um, but, you know, I think it was, it's a good, testament to the applicant trying to work to address our concerns. Um, with that said, I move to adopt the proposed consistency statement dated December 3rd, 2019, contained in the agenda material, and to approve the zoning amendment. This approval is also deemed an amendment to the future land use map to the extent described in the adopted consistency statement. I guess I should have closed the hearing first. So the hearing is closed. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Oh. Okay. And um, your motion is made. Do we have a second? A second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Passes 8 0. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have Z2119. This is a new hearing tonight. This is uh, about uh, a little bit less than 60 acres. On the east side of South New Hope Road, you can see that the property is currently uh, a combination of two different zoning districts. So you have residential 10, which allows 10 units per acre with some conditions on it. And then there's a pink portion of the site here that's in an existing plan development. We just created a new one a few minutes ago. Uh, and this uh, pink area here and the PD on the west side of South New Hope are what remains of a much larger uh, PD that we called Old Town that uh, was created many years ago uh, and has largely been undone by the R10 zoning on the east side of South New Hope that you can see on the map now. Um, so the uh, request here is for commercial mixed use which would allow a wide variety of commercial and residential office retail uses. Uh, Planning Commission recommends approval. The Southeast CAC also recommends approval. Um, and the mouse is not working. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a remnant of that larger uh, PD. Most of that was rezoned as part of Z718. Uh, and then the western portion of the PD that's remaining on the west side of South New Hope Road, you scheduled during your afternoon meeting for a public hearing in January. So uh, the PD is really on the way out the door. Uh, 
And you can see the full extent of that. This is down uh, southeast of the Walnut Creek Amphitheater, uh, outside the Beltline, but inside 540. Uh, so a couple of views of the site from New Hope Road. It's undeveloped at this point. Um, and the, there are a couple of conditions that I'm going to reference, and they refer back to this drawing. Uh, so there are conditions related to location of restaurants, location of grocery, and also uh, references to an existing uh, tunnel, and also a 150-foot buffer from exist the existing R10 zoning, which is illustrated in green, the green highlight on this map. Uh, so they've prohibited a handful of uses. They've limited the residential entitlement to um, specify that uh, 400, there'd only be 450 apartment units here and that the units would have no more than two bedrooms. The non-residential uses are limited to 360,000 square feet, so they're just capping that entitlement <coughs> based on the five-story height limit. They've come down a little bit from uh, what the site might otherwise facilitate. Um, they've limited the total gross floor area of non-residential buildings uh, in that 2221 South New Hope parcel. One parcel, remember I, I showed you that earlier. Uh, and then uh, if there are more than 100,000 square feet of commercial uh, square footage built, the site plan must uh, include a grocery store. Uh, there's a requirement for uh, no more than nine standalone restaurants in that uh, parcel right up, up along uh, North, uh, North New, Hope, uh, New Hope Road, uh, and that they should total no more than 75,000 square feet. And then the perimeter buildings, remember that green highlight that we looked at on the map, uh, where they're limiting height to four stories when they're within 150 feet of that uh, residentially zoned adjacent property in the green area. Uh, any additional, any trees that they plant will be of at least a particular uh, caliper at the breast height. Um, they have specified that bars must be at least 100 feet from any structure in the R10 zoned area that's adjacent. And if the pedestrian tunnel is usable, they have uh, specified a 10 foot wide path connecting the tunnel entrance to right of way that they might develop on the site. So the residential density, the, acre, the units per acre is going up. The actual entitlement is um, not quite doubling. They're uh, giving up office entitlement in favor of retail square footage. Um, the request is consistent with the community mixed use and private open space designation on the future land use map. It's consistent with a comprehensive plan. Overall, there's no urban form designation here on the map. Here are your consistent policies. A couple of inconsistent policies, but overall consistent with the plan. Again, the Planning Commission is in favor. And the um, Southeast CC. Uh, really contemplated this pretty heavily on the simple yes, no, they voted in favor. And then there is a um, kind of a contingent vote for a grocery based uh, request that garnered really not as much favor and more abstentions. And so we are focusing on that simple yes, no vote. What questions could I answer about this case on New Hope Road? I have one question about the um, limitation on two bedrooms. Mm -hmm. What is the thinking behind that? I'm just, you know, a three bedroom, a family could live there. Right, it's I think they're hearing that from the community and responding to community concerns there. I'll let Mr. Walker address why yeah, he's I, included that in his I think case. the applicant can address that, but <coughs> keep in mind <coughs> that the part that was previously approved is 1,500, I'll let him get the exact numbers, but it's more units that covers a wide scale of <coughs> units. Yeah. So significant I'll let the applicant, entitlement. Yeah, yeah I'll let I the applicant speak. I would like to, to hear more about that. Yeah, from the applicant. I have a question for staff. Yes. Um, what was the, I saw it was a planning commission split vote. What was the descending vote? Um I'm gonna look at my notes and okay. come back to you. Thank you. Yep. Okay, we will now hear from the applicant. Reminder eight minutes total good evening madam mayor members of the council my name is charles walker with entitlement preservation group 275 north p ridge road in pittsburgh north carolina 27312 
Uh, I have, as some of you know, I have a very long history with this project. I am the original designer of the Old Town PDD from 2003. God, that hurts even to say that. Anyway, the, uh, the bank took over, uh, last year the bank took over the, mo the majority of the project, about, about 500 acres, and rezoned it last year to R10. These, this tract of land and the other tract of land on the other side of the project are the only two remaining parcels of, of the PD development. This is before the UDO was, was created, so back in the day when you wanted to go to a higher level of design, you had to go to a PDD and, uh, development district, and that's what we did. The, uh, uh, Madam Mayor, to answer your specific question, the, uh, the owner of the remaining project of the uh, uh, part of the project is the Halley Group. Right. And one of the things that they do is apartment complexes. And the other thing they do is they are uh, developing an apartment complex on the other side of the project, but they're, what they're wanting to do is more of a regular suburban type of apartment complex with one, two, and three bedroom buildings. What we want to do at the urban center of Old Town, and what, that's what we want to do, is continue the urban center that was promised 16 years ago. And so the reason why we are limiting no more than two bedrooms is twofold, one of which it, eliminate, it, it minimizes the amount of parking spaces we need. And the other thing it is, as part of the grander uh, part of the plan, is we see that as more of an urban setting. So what the developer is wanting to do on that pro project is studios, one and two bedroom apartments. Okay. So it doesn't compete with the Halley Group at the other end uh, providing a completely different service. As far as the conditions go that have been added to the project, they are in direct res response to questions uh, that, the, uh, that the, uh, the neighbors had and also trying to weave in and continue the pro and continue the promises that were making that were made in 2003 the non-residential uses of 360,000 square feet is roughly what the original PDD allowed in that area again the reason why we're doing the two bedroom um, maximum is uh, as I just stated for the Halley group um, the one of the questions was uh, with the shopping center they wanted a grocery store anchored shopping center uh, that's what the neighbors would ask for. That area needs a grocery store and a more uh, centralized uh, place to come for uh, recreation and, uh, and for shopping. So what that condition was is they were afraid that the, uh, the neighbors were afraid that a shopping center would be built, there'd be no grocery store, and all the promises would be gone. So we put a condition in there that said quite specifically that up to 100,000 square feet of this area could be built, but, up in, but after that, a grocery store site plan had to be submitted, guaranteeing that a grocery store would be there somewhere in this process. Again, another question that they asked was for a, a higher level of landscaping, and uh, we were trying to decipher what that meant. I think that's part of the contingent vote as to what a higher level of landscaping meant. So what we worked out with both the neighbors and the staff was a simple thing that we promised. The current landscape ordinance requires two and a half foot, two and a half foot caliper trees. We're promising three and a half, and that was a, that was a simplistic way to uh, to guarantee to the neighbors that we would do more than uh, more than just was allowed by uh, by code. Uh, the standalone, uh, the 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 question of the bar uh, being 100 feet from uh, from the area. The uh, what we're trying to do here is build an urban core. So what we don't want to do is put places like bars and restaurants and shops and away from the neighborhood. I would enjoy living in Old Town being to cross the street to go to a neighborhood pub to watch the game. So that's why we're trying to both protect the surrounding residential that will be built someday uh, with a, a fully functional city center. And then finally, uh, as, the, uh, as the conditions stay here, there were two pedestrian tunnels that were built as part of the original Old Town project. At the time, what they were going to do, because if you remember, the original Old Town project had a golf course. What those tunnels were going to be designed to do was be allow for golf carts to go under from one side to the other without disturbing the traffic of the road pattern above. So in this case, what they're now going to be doing, since obviously the golf course is gone, they were going to be done, they were going to be looked at as pedestrian tunnels to connect both sides of the road. However, the Halley Group uh, is, has done some investigation and they believe that on the north side of the tunnel, the, the tunnel that's on the other side of the road from our project, 
may have a limitation of wetlands, but they haven't worked it out completely yet. So that final condition says, if the pedestrian tunnel cannot be used to go under the road, then we will provide a 10 foot wide greenway within our project that will attach to the main entrance sidewalk within the project that will ultimately lead to the greenway at, uh, at Walnut Creek. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I hope I've done this and not taken too much of your time. Any questions? Is there anybody else here to speak in favor of the project? Okay. Thank Is there you. anybody here to speak against the project? Okay. I'm going to close the hearing. Okay. Council Branch, this is yours again. Yeah, th this is a project that has been long overdue and a, a lot of requests from residents over in Southeast Raleigh, um, especially outside the Beltline, of having a place to go uh, to shop, you know, get pick up their fresh produce uh, without having to always go to either all the way downtown or to another jurisdiction. Um, neighboring jurisdiction um, that had a shopping center. So with that said, this is just part two of a three-legged stool um, that we will be moving forward. And I move to adopt the proposed consistency statement dated December 3rd, 2019, contained in the agenda material and to approve the zoning amendment. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion carries. All right, now we have um, Comprehensive Plan Amendment CP 719. All right, so um, the Comprehensive Plan is the city's chief uh, policy document that guides built development in the city, and the way that we amend it is by legislative action. That's you, that's where you come in. And citizens can propose amendments, and staff can propose amendments. In this instance, this is a change requested by a citizen. And the map that they're changing is the street plan, map T1. It shows where we think streets should be that don't exist already, and it uh, codifies and reinforces streets that already exist that we expect to continue. And so what is being asked here is a realignment of a proposed segment of Sumner Boulevard. So we're up um, on the west side of Capitol Boulevard, uh, west of Triangle Town Center, uh, between Capitol Boulevard and Old Wake Forest Road. And the um, request here is to realign and then redesignate the segment. So the street plan includes, gosh, probably 15 or 20 different types of streets with uh, different expectations about cross section, width, that kind of thing. And so what is happening here is going from an avenue four lane divided, which would be um, a pretty significant street with a substantial median down to a two-lane avenue divided, so basically reducing the lanes by half. The North CAC and the Planning Commission both recommend approval. Uh, and you can see this drawing shows um, <coughs> the removal of the uh, earlier alignment in X's, the little lower half kind of scratchy looking line there. And then the additional or, or alternate proposed alternative alignment is shown to the north there with a purple dash along it and that indicates the two-lane avenue divided versus the four-lane avenue divided which is shown in uh, turquoise elsewhere on the map so here's that existing street plan so you can see this uh, Sumner Boulevard would come uh, from the east side of Capitol Boulevard across Capitol and make the connection up to Old Wake Forest Road that connection is maintained by the amendment but the alignment and the width of the street would change. So there's that proposed uh, realignment. The zoning through here is all industrial mixed use with um, three, five, and seven height story limits. So that allows uh, lighter industrial uses. And the future land use map here is a mix of uh, regional mixed use and commercial mixed use. That's just a kind of a uh, distinction between anticipated entitlement, regional mixed use we expect would draw from a larger catchment area than the community mixed use and it's hard to see because the, the reds are incredibly subtle uh, that the line between regional mixed use and community mixed use roughly follows the alignment of the proposed Sumner Boulevard extension through this area. Uh, this is a growth center on the urban form map and there we are. 
the just some information about the traffic forecast here. So there are only about 14,000 uh, cars a day anticipated on this segment of Sumner, which would inf influence your decision about whether that reduction to the two-lane avenue divided might be merited. So you can see on the east side of Capitol, almost 40,000 cars a day. On the northwest side of Old Wake Forest, it drops down even to less than 5,000. So that piece uh, between uh, Old Wake Forest and Capitol uh, projected 14 to 15,000 cars a day. And the uh, uh, three-lane street, the, the four-lane here, which is what was initially proposed, would handle 15 to 35,000 cars a day. And then the three-lane, um, which is, uh, I guess, uh, uh, translate the this is po policy guidance that translates into what's in our, actually on the street plan uh, corresponds to about 8,000 to 20,000 uh, vehicles per day so that three lane uh, range is well matched to the 14 to 15,000 cars a day that are expected on this segment of the street so you can just see what that looks like so you have a travel lane in each direction with a median in the middle uh, and then the three lane uh, uh, avenue is um, a softer turn lane in the middle so you don't have that median. Uh, so this is consistent overall with the plan, no inconsistent policies were ad identified. Again, the North CAC and the Planning Commission both recommend approval. Uh, transportation staff is here if you have questions for them. I can also answer questions before you open the hearing if you would like. Well, first off, let me ask, um, who is here to speak in favor of this? <coughs> okay, Tom, hold on, who's here to speak against it? I would be inclined to close the hearing and make a motion to approve if that is cool with all of you. Can I do that? You have to open it. Yes, this is in my district and I will, I will second that motion. Uh, I think that is the applicant okay with that? I think the applicant would be fine with that. <laughs> Just want to make sure I get that on the record. All right, there we go. <laughs> okay, I've closed the hearing and um, do you want to make the motion? To sure, I'm, I'll make the motion uh, to d adopt the recommended comp plan amendment. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Worth, for being so cooperative. <laughs> Thank you. Good to see you again. Okay, now we have. <laughs> Now we have um, TCZ um, 319, um, 3800 Glenwood Avenue. Good evening, I'm Mark Holland with City Planning. Again, this is TCZ 3-19. This is a uh, change to the conditions that are associated with, a, uh, with the rezoning conditional use. Um, uh, this is for the property at 3800 Glenwood Avenue. Uh, this would amend the conditions that are associated with the zoning case Z67-05. Uh, again, uh, oh, sorry. Again, the property is located at 3800 Glenwood Avenue. Uh, just to orient you, this is inside the Beltway on the uh, east side of Glenwood Avenue. There are seven conditions that currently govern uh, the subject properties. Conditions generally uh, uh, regulate use, number, size, height of the buildings, reimbursement of right-of-way dedication, planted street yard, and residential density. Uh, this re request would modify the tenant space uh, size limitation only, which is condition B. Uh, the current condition places a limitation of 3,000 square feet on any individual tenant space. Uh, for uh, any uh, institutional, civic, uh, service, commercial, or recreational use. Uh, this is the current text of uh, Zoning Condition B. Uh, it, uh, again, it, uh, it uh, states that all uses must be located within the buildings that are uh, provided in, in Condition C and that uh, the institutional, civic, service, commercial, and recreational uses cannot exceed 10% of the gross floor area of each building. 
uh, that uh, that condition uh, would that would that, that would stay in the condition uh, is the uh, second portion of this where we have the exception of the of the bank use and the hotel use no um, none of those uses can exceed 3,000 square feet in size so again it would be that second sentence of the condition that would be stricken so you're looking at a condition that would just um, include the 10% floor uh, gross floor area exception being uh, kept in the uh, in the condition so just to show you the strike through it would be that second sentence again that would be um, removed from that condition this uh, application has gone before the Glenwood CAC it was uh, uh, did receive a unanimous uh, recommendation for approval as it did uh, with the uh, Planning Commission in October of this year again receiving unanimous approval uh, the staff is available for any questions on this um, and the uh, as I understand it, the applicant is here to speak on it as well okay whose district is this okay um, do you have any feedback or feeling on this in the interest of moving things along are you interested in moving this along uh, okay let me ask this um, Ms. Maddox you might get the same deal um, is there anybody one clarification here? can I finish um, is there anybody here to speak against this okay what's your clarification uh, I want to make it make it clear that this applies to the whole case known as Z 6705 which was approved in 2005 and it applies to both 3700 and 3800 Glenwood Avenue. Uh, but it, it's changing the conditions of that case, and that's how it was requested. Okay. Um, I can go into explanation. I could close the hearing, and Mr. Knight could make a motion. Are you okay I'll with that? I'll take it. Okay. Mayor. Hearing closed. Um, Mr. Knight, do you have a motion? Uh, yes, ma'am. I, I uh, move to uh, approve the request. Consistency statement. statement in the consistency statement as outlined. I have to read the whole thing. <laughs> yes. I think you can refer to it, right, Robin? All, all, the reason it was read just for clarification is because that was different than the it was the opposite of the one that was in your packet. So there was nothing to adopt. You've got one, so you just go for the short version. I can. I move to adopt the proposed consistency statement dated October 8, 2019, containing the agenda materials, and to approve the text change to the conditional use zoning. Second. Second. <laughs> Wake up. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Maddox, for going along. We appreciate it. Okay, now um, our, let's see. It's our final text change for tonight TC619 um, design alternates. I don't think this is going to be quite as easy, but we'll see. Come on, Travis. We will see. What you got? So um, first, I'll, I'll give a bit of background. And um, first of all, good evening. You've made it to almost the end of your agenda. So thank, thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, Travis Crane in City Planning. And I'm here to discuss TC 619, which is a staff initiated text change. So I'm going to start with an overview of the standards that are in place today, talk a bit about the requested change, and then wrap up with our next step. So, our code today contains standards for uh, new streets and when they should be constructed, when they um, should be extended, when they should be widened. Uh, this typically happens in conjunction with development plan review. Uh, so that's either a site plan or a subdivision, and that happens at the staff level, so it's administratively reviewed and applied. The code contains a standard known as block perimeter, and that sets the maximum distance of a block. And so if you are Imagining um, a street grid, you're, you're measuring around uh, the distance of a block. So the code has a, a couple of handy uh, pieces of graphic uh, for us. One is a, a table that identifies the maximum standards, and they are identified by zoning district. And there is also a nice graphic that shows us uh, what, a, what a block perimeter should look like and what uh, stub streets into adjacent properties would look like. So. This was a new standard that was placed into the Unified Development Ordinance back in 2013. And along with the new set of standards, uh, there was also the introduction of what is known as a design adjustment. So that was an additional path that an applicant could choose. Uh, it offered some relief to the standards. They were applied administratively. 
and uh, staff reviewed uh, the, the findings and could approve the request. And, and that happened up until uh, earlier this year. So you might ask, well, what's the problem with the standard that we have in the code? Uh, as we, uh, and being the city attorney and staff and city planning, took a look at the standards that were in place. Uh, we agreed that um, they allowed a, a bit too much discretion at the staff level. So the way that the administrative code should be applied is that staff is applying objective standards. Uh, there, there should be no subjectivity in staff's decision making. So we started this process to amend the code um, earlier this year with TC 219. And what that did was take the design adjustments for this section and send them to the Board of Adjustment. So that was the first step in this process. What we saw was that, that it uh, produced a very large increase to the workload for the Board of Adjustment. That obviously was not a long-term solution for us. So uh, this is the next step in the process. So we began drafting the ordinance that would create objective standards, uh, true objective standards that could be applied at the city staff level. The Board of Adjustment is still a part of the process. They could provide relief uh, in certain situations by applying the cr criteria and receiving evidence at a quasi-judicial public hearing. That's their appropriate role. So uh, in drafting this ordinance, the language was created by staff in city planning, uh, transportation, development services, and the city attorney's office. It was a true collaborative effort uh, where we met on a regular basis to identify the, the correct path forward. Also, this language was reviewed by the development services advisory committee, and that's a, a self-selected group of uh, development uh, representatives that um, provided us with some good feedback on uh, the language of this ordinance. So what uh, was produced was then a set of standards that they can be used and applied administratively, and I think more importantly, the users of this language being uh, administrative staff and, and the development community agreed that this is a, a good approach forward. So you might ask, what does this ordinance do? Uh, it would alter the standards for block perimeter. Uh, for street stubs and cross access. And these uh, items are contained in what we call Article 8.3 of the UDL. Would create the by right approval path in some instances, and that's by applying those objective standards. Uh, these exemptions that were previously staff approved represent what we think as, uh, as common sense approaches, common sense exemptions. And we're gonna walk through a, uh, a good example in a moment so you can see uh, how these would be applied and an uh, additional path to the Board of Adjustment is still present. So uh, there is a new minimum site area standard that has been applied. So you remember back to the chart that I showed that had the, the minimum areas. There is now a minimum site size that would be applied. Uh, there are some alterations to the language to make this uh, a bit more prescriptive. Um, and finally, we're renaming from design adjustment to design alternate. And that's setting the stage for the third uh, act that I'm going to speak about in just a moment. So here's a, a bulleted list of the by right exemptions. This obviously is not the exact text. Uh, this is just an overview of what's contained within the ordinance. So if a site is below the, the threshold size, meaning it's not large enough uh, to accommodate a uh, new street extension, then it would be exempt. If um, the uh, site would not result in a conforming block or reduce um, by 20% or less, the block perimeter by 20% or less, it would be exempt. Uh, if the, uh, the product would not result in a new block that is at least 50% of the standard, then it would be exempt. Uh, if a new street would consume 15% of the subject lot or the adjacent lot, then it would be exempt, and that's an important standard. Uh, so all of these uh, were created uh, with an eye towards whether or not extension of the street or creation of the street made sense or represented a larger taking than what we would normally find uh, for extension of public right-of-way. Uh, last few here, uh, if the applicant produces a sealed traffic study that shows a level of service F, uh, then uh, there could be certain exemptions. Uh, if there are obstructions present, um, and we've got a list of them, uh, if their value of improvements uh, exceeds that uh, of the value of the land, if there's a railroad or highway that's in the way, those are immovable objects. If there's a water course that um, contains the drainage area of one square mile, 
then uh, there would not be a requirement there. If there's tree conservation area uh, in the way, then there's no requirement to, uh, to extend, or if there's open space or park. Uh, and finally, if the existing blocks do not exceed 150% of the standard, then there would be an exemption. And then finally, the last uh, set of standards, if NCDOT denies any type of connection, then there would be an exemption. If there were certain uses present, so if there's a historic landmark, a cemetery, landfill, hospital, school, place of worship, uh, like a church or synagogue, police, fire, EMS station, or prison uh, that would prevent the extension of the street, then that uh, extension would be exempt. And then uh, something that we saw quite commonly, if there was a residential use with an attached building, which is what we call a single family house, uh, I'm sorry, a duplex or a detached building, which is a single family house, on a lot that's less than two acres in size, then the street would not be required. So um, I promised that we'd look at an example, and this is a, a real life example that, um, that we identified. Uh, this property is zoned office mixed use. It is less than an acre in size. The existing block perimeter is 3,800 feet, and it's surrounded by a single family detached um, product zoned R6. So with the current code, a street extension would be required for this development. And so you see the red parcel here on the corner, that's the subject property, less than an acre in size. You see the blue line, that's the block perimeter, that's the measurement of 3,800 feet. The code today, as written, would require this corner property to connect a street north-south from White Oak Road uh, up to the north and stub into these properties. Well, as you can see, the properties to the north are single family detached, they're zoned residential. The street doesn't make any sense. So, in a previous world, I see the face of confusion, and I understand that well. Um, in a previous world, this would have been a candidate for a design adjustment, and staff could have exempted it. Um, but it was using a different set of criteria that were not objectively applied. So now we have uh, proposed a new set of objective criteria that would not require the street connection north-south on this property. So um, going through the criteria, I won't read through all these, but for a host of reasons, that street would not be um, required in the future if this ordinance were in place. That would be good. Yes, ma'am, I agree. Yes. So then let's talk a bit about next steps. Um, we're currently drafting an ordinance now uh, that would essentially um, be phase three of this approach, and that's looking at our new street standards and applying the same type of methodology, identifying uh, certain situations where uh, staff can apply objective standards in the code and allow for meaningful street connections and extensions. Uh, we are currently drafting that language now. Our expected delivery to the Planning Commission is at the beginning of next year, 2020. With that, I am happy to take any questions you might have. Yes, <laughs> Council. I'm okay. trying to um, trying to follow along as best I can. It's also getting late. Um, just looking through the agenda material, I saw that uh, one thing in here says that it's um, this is going to help identify a path to the Board of Adjustment for a design alternative. But so is our our goal here is just to make it more efficient and easier to to, to sort of do business with the city and to not be sending as much stuff that way? Is, is, that, is that what we're going at with this? That's one of the products, and that's, um, that's a positive product yes. here, is reducing the workload of the Board of Adjustment, but while also allowing uh, for a meaningful, objective application of the code at the staff level. So staff could handle more of these that's correct. situations. Great. Okay, thank I, you. I'll say the uh, original intent was for staff to handle them. It was just written in a way that they weren't allowed to do it. Yeah. So we couldn't make all these objective things up in like a minute so we parked it there essentially but you and said this is going to make us more efficient way okay got it. that's correct <laughs> so i have a question is there anybody here in the um audience who would like to speak against this <laughs> oh <laughs> 
Brian, you were so enthusiastic. I'll give you like 20 seconds. How's that? We're trying to move things along. He's speaking in favor, correct? He's You're speaking, speaking in favor. Um, good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Congratulations. Welcome back to a few of you. Welcome to the remainder. Brian O'Haver, 223 Southwest Street. I, the only reason why I want to take a few minutes is because there's going to be a handful of these that are going to be coming forward. And I just want to quickly make a couple of points. One, the backstory, when we were working with the consultant on the original UDO, I served on a council appointed task force. And this was one of the items that we identified back in 2012 that we knew was going to be an issue that still found its way into the code. There are a handful more of those things that are going to be coming forward. So just to kind of set that stage. And the other thing I want to say is the process has been awesome. Staff has worked hard. David York's team, they brought in the DSAC, which I'm involved in. So everybody got together. The DSAC, we spent Just probably five for the, or so. For the new per people on council, that's the Development Services Advisory. That's right, that um, Travis had commented. We spent five hours alone just looking at this text, and it went back with David, and it went to staff. So it was very vigorous. I know some of it might seem confusing, but so thank you for your time. Thank you for everything you've done today. I just really wanted to set the stage because my understanding is there's going to be a handful more of these, and these are very important to be more efficient even earlier. One of the women mentioned, and it's a true impact of the amount of time to get permits. It's costing a lot of money, and so this is just moving forward to that, and it's really low-hanging fruit that – Travis showed a perfect example. It doesn't make sense. We don't need to take that to the Board of Adjustments. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, and thank you for thank your time. Thank you, Mr. O'Haver. Um, we are going to now close the hearing. Would anybody like to make a motion to approve? I move to adopt the proposed consistency statement dated December 3rd, 2019, containing the agenda materials, and approve the zoning text amendment. Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. No? Okay. We're good. Can we bring the rest of those um, to the council as soon as possible because, man, that's stuff that really does need to be fixed. Good work, people. Thank you. Working, working, working. Okay, like it. And now we have the evidenti evidentiary hearing. I just have to ask, um, the woman in front with the two young children, are you just hanging out at our meeting? Really? Well, Well, I just want to commend you for being here, but also tell you that uh, those are two of the best well-behaved children I've seen in a long time. Bless you. <laughs> yes. We're almost done. <laughs> they still have smiles on their face. That's like amazing. So anyhow, thank you for sticking it out and being here with us. All right, so Robin, you're going to take the evidentiary hearing, correct? That's right. We're going to get through this as quick as possible. I think the applicant is here. Um, just quickly, I need to go through what a quasi-judicial hearing is. It's a little different than uh, a legislative hearing, which you just did. Um, the, the hearing tonight is a question before you as to whether or not a property in a residential, I mean, a, a historic overlay district can be subdivided. Um, the UDO requires a quasi-judicial hearing. What that means is you have to use different procedures. You can't discuss the case outside of the hearing. You can only base your decision on the evidence presented at the hearing. Uh, the witnesses have to be sworn in certain circumstances if there's um, the uh, parties want to do cross-examination. I'm tired too. Um, they're allowed to do that. Um, so basically what we're going to do first, we're going to swear the witnesses. Then we're going to allow our staff people to do a quick overview. We're going to let the applicant present its case. If there are any opponents, the opponents can present their case. The applicant can sum up their case and then we'll bring it back to the table. There should be a motion for and against in your materials that someone can um, can make so that a decision can be rendered. You may remember that our office uh, will pre prepare findings of fact and conclusions of law. A written decision is required by state law. That'll come back at your next hearing for adoption. So having said that, anyone who plans to testify today, if they could come up and let the clerk swear them in, we can get that done.
Okay, first we'll have staff give a quick overview of the request. Good evening, um, Alicia Bailey Taylor with the Development Services Department. Uh, so S4818 is a proposal to subdivide a vacant uh, 0.38 acre parcel of land located at 501 East Lane Street in the north central part of the city um, into three lots. The property is zoned residential 10 with a uh, general historic overlay district. This proposal is subject to the Unified Development Ordinance regulations listed on this slide and was reviewed by city staff for compliance with the applicable objective standards of the UDO. Uh, the UDO specifies that the approval process for this subdivision includes review and recommendation uh, by the Raleigh Historic District Commission and uh, the quasi-judicial uh, review by the city council that our city attorney has just explained to you. The Historic District Commission reviewed the proposed subdivision in October and unanimously recommended approval. And uh, with that, I will, um, I can turn this over to um, Chad Essick with uh, Pointer Spruill um, to present any information that the applicant would like to bring forward. If you have any questions for me, I can also answer those. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there enough for me? Good evening, Mayor, uh, members of City of Council. Again, Chad Essick with Pointer Sproul, 301 Fable Street, Suite 1900. I'm here this evening on behalf of the property owner, Oakwood Sanctuary LLC, as well as the home builder uh, for this site, Grayson Homes LLC, uh, requesting that City Council provide final approval of this proposed preliminary subdivision uh, located in the Oakwood Historic District. Um, Joining me here tonight is Mike Poupard, is the president of Grayson Homes, and John Frazier, engineer with FLM Engineering. Um, I handed up to you some packets of exhibits for the council members. Uh, just so you know what's in those packets under tab one is just a site map with aerial and an aerial lot uh, uh, that shows aerial of the lot dimensions of the existing lot as well as the surrounding lots. Under tab two is a larger size of the preliminary subdivision plan uh, so you could see it better. Uh, under tab three is just a proposed building uh, concept footprint layout on those three lots. Uh, under tab four is a sworn affidavit of Tanya Tully, and under tab five is a sworn affidavit of Alicia Bailey Taylor. Uh, the reason for the affidavits was in the hopes that we could get all this testimony in written format and in the record so that we didn't have to call them up here to testify to all these things and we streamlined the process. So that's the reason for the affidavits and um, I'm not going to go through them specifically, but let me just briefly touch on a few things and then um, um, I can answer any questions that the council may have. Um, as uh, the city attorney mentioned, uh, this is a quasi-judicial hearing, um, although there are no subjective standards to be applied to this uh, preliminary subdivision review. It's whether or not the subdivision meets the objective standards under the UDO. Um, Alicia did a nice job summarizing the request and her staff report and affidavit detail each section of the UDO that is applicable and how this application complies with each one of those. Um, uh, this is, as noted, a 0.3-acre parcel located at the corner of North East Street and East Lane Street. Um, the proposal is to subdivide this, uh, this, lot into th this existing lot into three lots for the purpose of constructing three single-family homes. As noted, the property is zoned R10, uh, with, within the Oakwood uh, General Historic Overlay District, which requires a minimum lot size of 4,000 square feet. 
a minimum lot width of 45 feet uh, for interior lots and 60 feet for corner lots and a minimum lot depth of 60 feet. Uh, as noted, um, all of those requirements are satisfied. All these lots meet all of those requirements as shown on Exhibit 2, uh, as well as outlined in Ms. Uh, uh, Bailey Taylor's affidavit. Um, Again, um, if you review uh, Ms. Bailey Taylor's affidavit, you go through the entire thing, it out goes through each section of the UDO and demonstrates uh, why this subdivision meets the requirements of all the, all the objective requirements. Uh, if you look at paragraphs 21 and 22 of Ms. Bailey Taylor's affidavit, it confirms that the applicant has met all the procedural requirements in section 10.2.5 and that the Development Services uh, Department has determined that the subdivision application meets all applicable requirements and provisions of the UDO. Um, I will note that um, this is just preliminary um, subdivision approval. We're talking about subdividing the lots. So when the builder comes back to actually construct the homes on the lots, they were required to go back to the RHDC um, for what's called a certificate of appropriateness to determine whether or not those homes that are being proposed are congruous with the historic district or are not incongruous with the historic district as a whole. So that will be the next step in the process. So this is only dealing with uh, the subdivision. As I noted, um, looking at these um, lot dimensions, um, you'll see on the same side of East Lane Street, the lot widths of range anywhere from 43 feet to 60 feet, and these lots range from uh, 47 to 60 feet, all consistent with the lot width uh, along that block and across East Lane Street. You'll see the, the lot widths are consistent as well. So. Um, at this time, I would ask that um, all ex uh, of our exhibits one through five be moved into the record and be made part of the record. Um, I didn't see anyone come uh, planning to testify in opposition, so unless someone jumps out behind the curtain, I'll, I don't think that'll be necessary. And um, we'd ask the, um, the council uh, vote to approve the preliminary subdivision application. Happy to answer any questions. Again, uh, the applicant is here as well as the engineer if there's any technical questions that we can address, uh, but we would uh, ask for your approval. Okay, one more thing. You move to admit there's nobody here who has any objection to the admission of Exhibits 1 through 5. Okay, those will be admitted in the record. The next question, is there anyone here who would like to present evidence in opposition? Okay, having seen none, do you have anything else you want to say, Mr. Essick? No. Okay, you, Thank you. you rest your case. I do rest my case. Okay, so it's appropriate to bring it back to the table. Mm -hmm. So based on the evidence presented at the hearing, I move to approve the subdivision application for S48-2018, 501 East Lane Street, subject, subject to and including the proposed conditions of approval. Second. Second. Um, I have one question before we vote. Yes. Um, I'm looking at um, item three, um, the footprint concept. and. My question is, as far as the height of the structures, is that something that is done through the COA, or is, do you know the height of these structures already, what they plan to be? That is something that I, I don't, uh, Mike might be able to, to, to tell, I think they're two-story, two-story structures, uh, but as a part of going through the certificate of appropriateness process, they will look at is the height consistent with other homes on the same block or in the historic district. So height is determined looking at the context of the historic district, but my understanding is the plan for the homes is two stories. Okay. And also by you submitting this information, the footprint that I see here is the footprint of what the actual homes will be. That is the con that is how we've laid it out, and that's the concept of what we're planning to do. But again, that will be part of the uh, I just wanted to give some context to the board of what that what what it would look like with these on the lots, uh, but uh, I th it will this be part of This is just the breaking up the lots. Okay. Yeah. I'm just asking because he submitted, you know, a footprint that's detailed. So I want to make sure what you presented is what you are saying. Are those illustrative? Those are illustrative of what we plan to do when we submit for our for our for our attorney help. <laughs> the ultimate decision is going to be uh, up to the RHDC. I got right. it. Right. Okay, I'm ready. I'm yeah. fine. So we get for having two attorneys Three. No, um, on there. Uh, well, yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. So, um, anyhow, the motion was made and seconded. Um. <laughs> uh, all in favor? All in favor. Aye. Aye. 
Aye. Aye. Those who oppose. All right. Motion carries. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We have, uh, thank you um, everybody for sticking it out this long this evening. It was a, a long, long day and a long night. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, we had one order of business that we were going to discuss tonight. Um, made a note about the retreat, February 7th and 8th date. Um, everybody put that on hold on their calendar. Um, Mr. Uh, Councilor Knight is um, going to let us know tomorrow, you said? About close of business. That's perfect. Um, we'll let us know, and then um, I will let you know, and then we can um, n do the proper notification, do whatever we need to do that. Is everybody okay with moving ahead with that? Mm -hmm. Do we need a motion? I would, no, I would just say, why don't we just bring it all back at your January 7th meeting, and it just allows us to plan for I the I just event. want it on everybody's calendar, though, because yeah. I don't want a, something to come up, and then we change dates. So if you'll let me know, that will be terrific. So thank you again, um, and thank you for the two wonderful children up there. You win the City Council Great Kid Award. Definitely. All right? Thank you. Motion, I mean, meeting adjourned. Thank you.